19, 2017 is called to order. First item is approval of the agenda and order of priority. So moved. It's been moved. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. We begin with the introduction of state board members and guests. Uh, Marilyn, at this time, please introduce the board. Yes, to my immediate left is Brian Whiston. He's the state superintendent and chairman of the board. And as we go around clockwise, Richard Ziley is the co-president of the board and he resides in Dearborn. The other co-president of the board, Cassandra Albrecht, resides in Rochester Hills. Michelle Fecto from Detroit is um, the secretary of the board. She's on her way. Nikki Snyder. Nikki, where are we saying you're from? Pinckney? Uh, Nikki's in the process of a move. <laughs> she, she's the NASB delegate, the board's association. So in the Pinckney area is where Nikki resides. Yes. Tracy Hordisky is the Michigan Teacher of the Year. She's from Kenowa Hills. And as we go across the table, Tyler Sawyer, he's from the governor's office. He's a strategic advisor for education and career connections, right? And then Eileen Weiser is on her way. She's a board member from Ann Arbor. Lupe Ramos Montini is board member and she is from Grand Rapids. Pamela Pugh is on her way. She's board member from Saginaw. The treasurer of the board is Tom McMillan. He's from Rochester Hills. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Thank you, Marilyn. Now we'll introduce the newest members of the team here at Michigan Department of Education. Vanessa, if you could begin, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have three new members, so Patty Chapman. Office Field Services. It's not up here. Not up here. All right. Okay, sorry. Shelby Lee from Educator Talent. Do you want to stand up and say a little I bit about yourself? Shelby Lee, and I am the secretary for the Office of Educator Talent. And I joined about three weeks ago, um, coming from spending 15 years as an administrative assistant in the pet supply industry. So this is different for me, and I'm looking forward to the opportunities. So we have Tim Tahini from Standards and Assessment. Hello, Tim Tahini, um, working in the admin and reporting group, have eight, uh, 18 years of experience in large-scale assessments, uh, contracted here for a year, and now a uh, full-time employee, uh, doing a lot of work uh, on our uh, reporting, requirements gathering, and uh, testing uh, of our reports, uh, and done a lot of work in the vertical to receive uh, reports that are coming out for the first time. Kyle, please. It's my pleasure to introduce Becky Grash with the Office of Financial Management. Hi, I'm Becky Grash. I am a new accountant with the Office of Financial Management. I also work as Chief Cashier for the department. And I came from the Treasurer Budget Office. And uh, this is my first foray into accounting. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Susan, please. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Julie Swarden, who is the new assistant in the P for 20 system. Julie, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself and your new job? I am going to be assisting Susan Broman in the P20 system and student transition. I have worked for the state of Michigan for uh, 17 years, and I came from the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, Michigan Veterans Affairs Agency. Did we miss any other new employees in the room? All right, let's welcome our new employees. <laughs> now we'll have the audience introduce your, our, yourself, and if we could start with Marty, please. Oh. Good morning, I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the Director of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Carolyn Weathen, I am the Legislative Liaison in the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Good morning, I'm Chelsea Martinez, Director of Communications government relations at the Secondary School Principals Association. Richard Thrush from Grand Rapids. Dorothy Monson from Grand Rapids, and we're learning a lot. <laughs> Judy Pritchard from Macomb Intermediate. I'm Sarah Kavinsky, who comes with the Calvin University. Chris Jacobs, Kathleen Nye, please. I'm Patty Kim, Director of 
Chris Flavor, Gong Renew Service. Steve Best in the Department of Education. Kyle Brown, Deputy Superintendent for Finance Operations. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent, Division of Educator Student School Supports. Susan Berman, Deputy Superintendent, the Supply Systems and Student Transitions. I live in Grand Rapids, by the way, but I um, spend my days here. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Sheila Alice, Chief Deputy Superintendent. Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff Brian Wilson. Thank you all. Public participation. If you plan on offering public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it up to Maryland. Forms are available on the table just outside of the boardroom. And they must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at that time to make sure you have the opportunity to comment. And Marilyn, you have an announcement. Yes, we're going to do something new today. Today is a statewide tornado drill. Hear me say drill, tornado drill. It's going to happen at 1 o'clock. We know it's going to happen at 1 o'clock. If you are in this building, you're going to go to the one of the two stairwells on either side of the elevator, and you're going to go down to the lower parking level. There will be people in orange vests that can assist you, but that's what's going to happen here. We know it's a drill. It's statewide. So that's what we're going to do today um, before we reconvene in the afternoon. And then when it's over, you just come right back up. If you happen to be outside, you're going to have to go through the guard area again. But, you know, you don't want to be outside if there's a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll remind you again before we go to lunch. Thank you. Committee of the Whole meeting, discussion items. The first item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is recognition of the National School Counselor of the Year, Terry uh, Torzinski. Please welcome Terry up to the table. Terry is from the Calhoun Area Career Center. She is the 2017 School Counselor of the Year, awarded by the American School Counselors Association. She received national recognition at the White House during a ceremony where Michelle Obama delivered her final remarks as First Lady. We often discuss here at the board table the important work done by our school counselors and how we need a lot more of them. We're fortunate that the National School Counselor resides in our state benefiting Michigan students and we thank you, uh, thank you to Terry and all the school counselors and educators who pour their heart and soul into assisting our students and helping them be successful. You often hear board members and others say the great things that are happening in Michigan school and Terry is an example of that truth and the good things happening. So let's welcome Terry and congratulations. <laughs> and Terry, did you just want to make a couple comments? Yeah, if you don't mind, I just yep. first of all I want to thank all of you for inviting me here. You know, it's a uh, as I receive these different recognitions and honors, it's always exciting and kind of um, unexpected for me because I just I love what I do with when I work with students. And so to be able to work with students, advocate for them, and at the same time be recognized by a board such as this is just an amazing feeling. So so thank you all for taking the time to inviting me for inviting me and then thank you also for supporting the work of school counselors. Much appreciated. So if we could have Richard and Cassandra, I think they have a plaque to present to you and we have a photographer to take some pictures. All right. So on behalf of the entire board um, <laughs> we are so proud that uh, you are representing Michigan in such a prestigious role this year. And so we just wanted to present to you just this, this plaque of our um, recognition for your achievements. And, um, and just uh, thank you so much for everything you've done. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. For must be come, quite a come down after Michelle Obama. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Come on now. I'm offended by it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is an important board. Thank you so much. Again, congratulations. Again, thank you for your great work and for your care for our, the kids in our schools. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is presentation by Garden City Schools on reading literacy. Garden School is here to present on a balanced early literacy program. They'll share imp information on implementation, funding, data, and success rate. If we could have the four presenters come up to the table. And Susan Ford is the principal of the uh, Lathers Early Childhood and Kindergarten Center. Alex McNeese is the director of instructional service. Lindsay Skeen is the K teacher. And Larissa Gibson is the Title I teacher. And I hope I said all your names right, but if I didn't, please correct me. But thank you for being here, and again, uh, thank you for what you're doing in the classroom and for getting the good results that you're getting to improve uh, the success for students in Garden City. So please, thank you. Thank you, table's yours. 
Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure, and thank you for bringing us to the board today. Um, it's an honor to present uh, the, uh, the great things our teachers are doing at Lathers. Um, and today we are talking about our series, uh, our multi-tier system of support to make sure students are, are reading at grade level. Um, today we're going to quickly review the data. Uh, we're going to go over a, a quick uh, overview of how we um, give elementary services. I'm going to tell you about the transformation timeline that we, we had from going from a traditional literacy program to a balanced literacy program. Um, we're going to talk about our school improvement process very briefly. Um, and then we're going to, uh, Lab is going to take over and they're going to talk about what they did to transform literacy in their building. And then finally, I'm really pleased that we'll uh, virtually bring our kindergartners into the room here with a very short video. Um, first, the data. Um, I want to point out that all this data can be found on mischooldata.com, but I put it in a little graph that makes it a little bit easier to see. Garden City is in green, Wayne County is in red, and the state is in gray. And these are our third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade literacy scores on the 2016 um, MSTEP. Um, so essentially what we're, we're saying is our transition and, and what we changed from, from a traditional system to a balanced literacy system is, is working and helping us achieve higher scores. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Garden City and how we deliver elementary services. Um, back in 2010, uh, during uh, a major financial crisis, we had to look at how we were giving our elementary services. We had five neighborhood elementaries that were K-6. Uh, we transitioned to four separate elementary schools that all delivered grade level content. Um, we've actually found, though, that delivering content in such a way helps put all of our teachers in one building, all of our resources in one building, and allows those experts, the teachers, the interventionists, to come together and devise a multi-tier system of support that's tailored for that grade level. Um, our transformation timeline essentially started back in 2010 when the Common Core State Standards were adopted by the state of Michigan. And we looked at our literacy and how, how we taught our literacy in, in our traditional system. We had the basal reader, we had the workbook pages, probably very much the same way we were all educated to read. And we looked at that system and how it wasn't gonna meet the needs of the new rigor of the Common Core. Um, so we decided to adopt a new balanced literacy program. And balanced literacy is where we don't just teach reading, we, we use writing, we use uh, listening to text, uh, we use speaking to help students read at higher levels. At that time, we also add some assessment. And assessment is the, the cornerstone of, of what we do. We added the NWEA and the DRA2 as our diagnostics and our levelers to find out where our students were reading. The other thing that's really important is that we adopted the professional learning communities framework, where essentially that means that we had teacher leaders and, and time for our teachers to come together and collaborate and use the data that we're generating on those assessments to devise new and, and professionally develop each other um, so that all of our teachers could become sort of master teachers of literacy. Um, we also added a student, uh, sorry, a teacher coaching model, which is also very important. Uh, teacher coaches go into classrooms, uh, they, they uh, observe lessons, they work one-on-one -on -one with teachers, they put together um, instructional rounds for teachers, all very effective strategies to help all teachers grow in the process of being better teachers of reading. Um, the MSTEP began in 2015, and then today, sort of where we're at, you saw the data, but it's a constant need for professional development. We're starting to ask really interesting questions about how we actually become better at this point. Um, and also, we have a constant need for materials. I just want to briefly mention that um, one thing that we are tight on is our school improvement process, gather, study, plan, do. Um, we, this is a slide that we use in front of all of, our, uh, all of our administrators, and our administrators follow the school improvement process. And essentially, that's how Lathers generated what you're about to see now. Some of these slides come right out of their school improvement framework slides. So at Lathers, um, we house all of the early intervention, all of the GSRP, and the kindergarten for the entire district, as Alex, uh, as Alex told you. Um, we are definitely a working class community. We have a variety of families with um, different needs. Um, we typically run between 55 and 65 percent free and reduced lunch. This year we're at 58, last year we were at 64. Um, this is just some data. Many of our kids have come to preschool, many of them have not. But a quarter of them are school of choice. That's a good one. Sorry. So the most important thing that I found as being a principal, not only at Lathers but in other building that I was in, is school improvement is that word that is tossed around constantly. But we really have to equate that to classroom improvement. Unless I can get my teachers to change their practices, 
and move to a best practice model, we will never see that full school improvement. So it goes back to the grassroots of getting my teachers to understand what do we need to do that's best for children. I worked collaboratively with a, a good friend of mine who just recently retired from Garden City Schools at the 1-2 campus. She told me um, when I came to Lathers in 2013, Susan, it is taking me until February to get these first graders where they should have been in September. We found that only 56% 50, of our kids that year went to first grade with the proper level of uh, performance in their literacy. So we started to look at changes that we needed to make. Um, we visited neighboring school districts, we did book studies, we had professional um, literacy consultants come in and work with our teachers. Uh, over the past four years, we've made major changes in our classrooms. Um, we have adopted Readers and Writers Workshop. We now do small group guided reading, um, utilizing the Daily Five framework. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of background on Daily Five, what it is, is it allows us as the classroom teacher to have centers where the children can work independently with a group of, of cohorts. Um, they work on reading to partner, they work on reading to self, they work on reading or working on their writing. They work with words, building words, um, writing words, and they um, are able to listen to reading, whether it is on an iPad, on um, an app, or it is at an actual listening center with the book in front of them. While the children are at their centers, we as the teachers are able to pull groups of children that are at like level and work with them on instruction at their level. So we are able to pull several different groups a day um, to ensure that we are giving appropriate instruction at their level where they need help to help them progress. Um, we are able to now have a coaching model where we have our literacy coach that comes in and can assist teachers that might need a little additional assistance with this new model. Um, we also do instructional rounds where we set it up that teachers can come into each other's classrooms, see what we're doing, see how we're doing it, and actually learn from each other. Um, it's been very powerful in our building. Um, we also have a social work support group um, supporter. Um, our social worker is amazing. She's able to help a lot of our little ones that are coming to us with some, some things that are going on in their home life or in their personal life that they're having a hard time coping with, um, which can sometimes deter them from, from learning and focusing. Um, she's able to work with them and, and she does amazing work. We are so thankful to have that program. Um, we have changed our assessment. We adopted um, Dibbles. Uh, MLPP we utilize, which is learning um, the children where they are with their letters, their sounds, their knowledge of books. Um, we use the DRA 2 in January and June, which allows us to see where our children are reading independently, what level of comprehension they have, and then it allows us to progress monitor them from January to June, continue instructing at the level they're at, and push them. And then in June we see where we, where we are, and hopefully we've hit the mark. Um, so I just wanted to piggyback on just a couple of things that Lindsay mentioned because we know that our presentation had to be very concise and condensed. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about our Kindergarten Connections program, which is our social work program, we have a brochure. Um, we have some more details in your little folder if you want to look a little bit deeper. Uh, there's some great information in here that we have included and um, I think that that will give you a better picture of some of the things that we do it explains what Daily Five is in a nutshell. Um, so, so anyway. Yeah. So moving on, and Lathers is great at data. So we're gonna share some of uh, the data of where they're at now and where they ended last year. So first. So this pie chart represents our DRA score. So the DRA is an assessment tool that we use to determine whether students are reading at, above, or below grade level. So if you take a look here, these are scores just from um, this past January. Uh, we had 29% of our students reading below grade level. Uh, we were able to attain 19.2% of students reading at grade level. And then in the blue, you can see 51.8% of our students who are reading above grade level. This represents what students. Page? Students who are able to read at grade level expectations. In kindergarten. In kindergarten. Just the kindergarten. Just the kindergarten. Okay. Um, so just to do a little um, backtracking, so at the end of last year, this is sort of a snapshot of where we were able to end up um, at the end of last year. We had 8.8% of our students reading um, below grade level, which is the equivalent of about 19 kids um, who, were, who haven't met the grade level expectation. Um, for students reading at grade level, we had 46% of them, so close to half of our students who are reading at grade level. 
Um, and then above grade level, we have about 45.1% of students. And of those students, many of them are reading a year above grade level. So we were able to make some really great gains with students. So I now mention something very quickly because we did change this graph. Uh, they are so data focused. Their original pie graph had about 14 different slices because the DRA2 levels students and that's the data that they're transferring into uh, this pie graph. So those students that were in the red were, lead, were reading at a level uh, uh, A, 1, or 2, um, where 3 and 4 is what we consider to be grade level and then beyond. And it goes all the way up to 14, which is a mid-first grade level. And you have that, that colorful chart that Alex told you about. We did put it. It's on the last page of the left side of your folder. Um, I know the scores don't always mean a lot unless you're in that grade level, but um, it tells you where, where our weak spots were. And this slide just explains that we do have a multi-tiered system of support. So our entire whole group, um, all of our students, are getting the core instruction with their classroom teacher. Um, the guided reading, the, the, the instruction at their level, basically. Then any of our students that are still struggling beyond that core instruction, we allow them to go um, either work with our tutors who give them some one-on-one -on -one or small group additional assistance in building the skills that they're lacking, or we are able to partner with another teacher in our building since we are all kindergarten, and they get double guided reading. So they may get guided reading with me in the morning at their level, and then they might get some additional guided reading with another teacher who might be hitting um, the instruction slightly differently, but the same instructional um, material. Uh, then from there, if children are still struggling with their core instruction, the tutors, as well as some double guided reading or some assistance, um, we do move them to our title services, which is Mrs. Gibson. Um, in the second tier, we do have something called Help Team, where it's a response to intervention program. We bring our children to Help Team. We get to sit down with our school um, social worker, our reading specialist, our psychologist, um, a whole panel of experts and kind of delve deeper with the teacher and the child's family to see what we might be missing and what we can do to help really holistically help that child to succeed. And then we still progress to the title reading. Um, I did want to mention one other thing that's in your folder. I'll just spend a couple of seconds on it. My um, One of my strongest opinions is that having this pacing guide has provided continuity for all of my children, for all of my teachers. Um, that old model, if you wandered from classroom to classroom, you would see one teacher doing letter of the day, letter of the week, um, and you'd find another classroom doing more rigorous instruction. We have a pacing guide, and if you look at it, you will see that if you were a brand new kindergarten teacher coming in from, say, second grade, you would know exactly what to teach, what lessons to introduce in guided reading, or in, um, you know, in a reader's workshop, in writer's workshop, uh, what sight words are being introduced, and at the beginning of the year, what letter sounds are introduced. This is our roadmap. This is how we stay on track so that all kids have that continuity in their instruction. So with our grants, we, um, we have early literacy grant, uh, Title I uh, title funding, and our Section 31A at-risk grant. Um, obviously, our salary for Larissa is our, is our most... Uh, our largest piece, um, Larissa serves as our title teacher and our reading uh, coach. We also bring in quality um, PD, literacy consultants, and also a large amount of money has to be sent towards buying the materials. We need books. We need books at all levels because kids are reading at all different levels in kindergarten, believe it or not. And um, I did have a picture in there also of just showing you some of the quality resources we use. We use our money for our kids. Um, in every in every part of what we do. So um, and then we're going to jump right to the video. So we're going to bring the kids into the room. We talked about guided reading. We talked about balanced literacy. We talked about daily five. You're actually going to see those happen right now on the screen uh, in Lindsay's classroom. Um, I do need to say that this is the day we got back from our spring break, okay? And that's a rough thing for kindergartners, but um, as you'll see, she's a master teacher. And she and had no at, warning. Yes. I just, I just <laughs> popped, in with, yeah. I popped in with my cell phone, literally, so it was very impromptu. <laughs> would like to be a pop star. I'd like to sing and dance and that's what pop stars do. I love pop stars. Did she tell us why she yeah. wanted to be a pop star? Yeah. Did she tell us what she'd do? Yeah. Yes. 
That was exactly what we were trying to do, wasn't it? Thank you for another round of applause. I love it. Okay, let's do D'Anthony's group at my table. D'Anthony's group. It is. Here, I'll call. I know. I'm going to hold my hand. I'm going to hold my hand. Hi, D'Anthony. Bananas. Okay, Sophia, where are we trying to go? Mackenzie. So right now the children are picking which center they would like to go to, whether they're working on um, reading to or writing, listening to reading. If we were still doing the letter people and uh, learning a letter every week, which is a very traditional kindergarten curriculum, we'd only be on W. And you saw our kids are, they're reading, they're writing. This is, um, they do a great job teaching at Lavish. And the little group that you did just see in the video, that is considered a very low group for this point of the year. That was her lowest reading group in her entire class. Um, but we're making great progress with those kids, and our, our hope is that they will land on grade level. Thank you so much. Are there uh, any questions? Any questions? Okay, Dr. Z, please, and then Eileen. Well, first to comment, uh, it seems, you know, American um, education traditionally has been you put the teacher in the classroom, close the door, and they sink or swim. And uh, it seems that uh, your description of your re reorganization, you seems like you've really overcome that and have teachers in, in teams, and um, that, that's a real achievement. So I, I commend you for that. I wanted to ask, you describe balanced literacy. How does that differ, from, if at all, from the old uh, whole language approach? Well, I think that the main thing is that um, with balanced literacy, you are looking at all of the components. And whole language, and that was probably at a time when I wasn't in education or I was actually home with my children at that time, um, whole language did not have as much of an intentional focus on phonics. Um, and we do both. We do inventive spelling, but we do phonics. Um, we do sight words, but we are teaching reading strategies. So we believe that phonemic awareness, 
um, is a big part of learning to read. We believe that writing is a big part of learning to read and that they're all connected. You can't really have one without the other. So we're, we're combining all of the different aspects of literacy um, so that we are meeting the needs of all of the children. Uh, and whole language, I think it had its place at that time, but an example is my own children were in a district that was still teaching phonics. Then we moved to a district that had been primarily whole language. When my youngest arrived in fourth grade in, um, in Livonia, um, that was their first year to get spelling tests. Well, my little one had had spelling tests for those other years because he was from a district with phonics. So it's a very different approach, but I think the, the key word is balanced. We're not putting all of our eggs in one basket. We're not saying that it's only phonics. It, it's a large part of it, but it's not only phonics because we know we have to teach those frequency words, those sight words, because that just makes sense and that's what keeps our kids um, you know, reading at those earliest levels. You don't want to have to sound out the word the. Every time you encounter it, right. you're not going to sound it out. You teach it as a sight word. So there's common sense and there's best practice approach and we have looked at what the experts are telling us makes sense for teaching at the SAGE level. Our building is very different. You know, we have almost 500 children in our building, and the oldest in September is five. So the instructional practices have to work. We have to have very intentional focus on what works for children at this age. And I think that we do a good job with that. I, um, I appreciated your, uh, the, the, what you, the exit that you shared with us uh, illustrates all of what you, you've mm -hmm. been sharing with it, you just said. Um, and my final, uh, I guess, observation is it uh, seems like you have a very uh, pacing. So everyone's learning to climb the same ladder, which means, which helps facilitate kids learning from one another. Mm -hmm. uh, I can imitate what my neighbor is doing, and it's more likely to be helpful than mm -hmm. not, which is uh, some, some, uh, implementation of individualized instruction has lost those advantages mm -hmm. so you seem to have a good uh, uh, plan that all your teachers and students can get get on board right you'll notice that when you saw that video um, during the literacy block it's not a real quiet time it's not <coughs> rambunctious and it's not loud but if I enter my classrooms I, I hear that healthy buzz of children talking and sharing but they're all working the whole point is that at those stations and those centers, and I sometimes I hesitate to call them centers because I think of people thinking, oh, they're giving them a worksheet and it's busy work. That is not the whole point of Daily Five Literacy Stations. They are supposed to be doing authentic literacy activities. You might see a piece of paper, but at the majority of my stations, you're not going to. You're gonna see paper if they're writing at the writing station. But if they're working with words, they're not doing um, you know, a phonics activity on paper. They're probably building it with what looks like Duplo blocks, only it has letters on the blocks. So we're really, um, we're really focusing on, on those things that have to, you know, have to work for our kids. Eileen and Tom. Well, I want to thank Nikki uh, for visiting you and then asking you to come to visit us because this is really amazing and wonderful. Um, I can't say enough kudos uh, for taking that early initiative when we adopted the standards in 2010 and saying this is it. Uh, we want to move forward on them and then <coughs> using multi-tiered system support and uh, response to intervention to weave this whole thing together for kids so that they can enter school uh, adequately prepared. I have a couple of questions because it looks so good. Um, are you consciously using competency-based learning um, in this model, or is this simply, um, that's the first one, is this simply um, an intervention for reading? That's one question. With the pacing guide, how are you tracking student progress? Are you tracking individual competencies, or are you giving traditional grades? And the, is the system sustain, sustainable, you mentioned the Title I Early Literacy and 31A grants. Is it sustainable only with those grants, which I, I anticipate would be continuing, or is it something that's become becoming embedded enough in your practice that you can um, uh, eventually do it with your foundation grant? And the last one is, I think I hear you support keeping these existing state standards because they're working for you. Yeah. 
A lot of, a lot of different questions great there. Questions, um, yes, um, <laughs> great questions, Eileen. Those are great questions. Great program. Yes, 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 and, and yes. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, some of those are definitely Alex answers, and I might have a few. So there. very early on, Lathers was one of our early implementers for a standards-based report card. And if you go to Lathers and you get the report card, moms and dads actually see the skills, where they're at, and where their kids have accomplished. They actually can see all the skills that they're going to be learning throughout the year. So it's kind of like a, a roadmap. Students and parents know what they're going to have to learn. And we're always trying to tailor that and make it better. Um, when a student does fall behind on the pacing, because pacing is important, but guess what? Kids learn at all different paces, right? So that's where our RTI system, our multi-tier system of support, our, our tier two help comes in to, to catch a student up. Um, the third question, I'm gonna jump right to the, the grants. The grants, this is um, Lathers, and I'm the state and federal grants person for our district. Lathers gets approximately $200,000 in grant funding each year. And all of that is put into staffing and materials and professional development that uh, is all about trying to, to improve instruction and, and do our multi-tier system of support. So that's, that's a big deal. The Common Core State Standards are also something that when it was adopted, we said this is the new rule and it has a higher level of rigor and how are we gonna meet them? So you know, we're, we essentially will teach the standards that, that we're, we have in front of us. I've put together new report cards based on these new standards. This is something that um, we have no problem <clears throat> moving on. I wanted to just um, make a comment on that one question about is it sustainable even if we did not have the grants? I believe that it is because, as you heard, the, the main difference is, is what we're doing in our core instruction. We want the grants. I am always asking Alex for more money. He can tell you that. Actually, yeah. I am always trying to get more money out of Alex because I have a great way to spend it on my kids. And he knows that I'm always going to come. I, Alex, Through the school improvement process. Yes, And, and Susan, is, yeah. you got yeah. to see those slides that you saw today were from her school improvement exactly. meetings. It's always to accomplish something that's already been decided on as a staff. But Alex, if I had a little more money for these additional books, Alex, if I had a little bit more money for this additional presenter, um, because it, it all goes back to that focus of what we're trying to accomplish. But I think that the main difference is this is our core instruction. This is what, that's that, that lower level of, you're familiar with that pyramid chart. Um, this is the lower level of instruction, meaning that all children get the best core instruction that we are giving them. So even without the grants, that, I mean, if I didn't have the grants, I wouldn't have Larissa. So my struggling students, we would have to come up with a different way of meeting their needs. We can do it at a higher level with the grants because what Larissa does, and you have some pictures of that here, um, she works with that Level Literacy Intervention Program from Faunus and Pinnell. She also uses Orton Gillingham, which is commonly used with our special needs kids. But we're using that with many of our at-risk kids with success. So yes, we, we would definitely sustain our core instruction. What would be hard to do is to meet the needs of those seriously struggling students because that's what, we, that's what our title and grant money is for, is for those children that we don't want them to fall between, you know, fall between the cracks. And as far as that progress goes, as far as what you asked about how do we, we work with this pacing guide, but we are doing <coughs> ongoing assessment. We're not just assessing DRA or Dibbles. Dibbles is done, Jan, uh, J Dibbles is done September, January, and late May. Uh, DRA is only done January and June, but I can assure you that every single classroom teacher we every progress two, monitor every two like weeks. Every, every two to three weeks. Yeah. We're, we're doing running records. We're checking their sight word knowledge. Um, we're sending information home. Okay, your child still hasn't quite picked up these three words. Here's some uh, games that you can do at home. And this is what I'm doing in class. We don't expect that every child that we send some game-based activities home with are going to necessarily do it. But we're at least providing some resources for our families that will. Right. Um, we're... we're we are on our data like crazy. Right. So it is not just a waiting <laughs> no. game to like, fingers crossed, let's see if in four no. months they've no. progressed. No. We're doing everything we can to ensure we know exactly where every child is, exactly what they need, ensuring that the tutors have what they need to get that child where they need, and ensuring that we still are trying to meet one-on-one -on -one with these children, aside from mm -hmm. just our small group, to really boost those babies and get them where they need to be. Can I just ask one follow-up yep. question? 
I, actually, it's a comment. I see so much passion here for children and for your jobs that it's almost, I, I want to just take you on the road. <laughs> I don't want to keep Laura, too. Um, but how difficult was this for your teachers to adopt? It sounds as if you were gung-ho from the very beginning and that you had the, the standards that you needed to be able to do the work you wanted to do. But I've not heard of that many districts doing MTSS uh, uh, so early in the process. And I'll try to be brief. This started as part of our school improvement and district improvement plan when uh, our, one of our former principals and Susan, and we saw some of our teachers uh, say, hey, I'm seeing this different, they, they're researchers. They get into it, they, they're reading professional articles. They found, if I wanna, no teacher wants to be a C minus teacher, right? They don't come to work not wanting to be their best. And they were seeing these different techniques and they started doing them in their classroom. So we said, well, how do we actually share that knowledge? Because if we go into our rooms and we close the door and we teach, then you get what you, yeah. that's it, it's all separate. And teamwork has gotta be the, the big focus. And the PLC system is the backbone of that, which is, it, it is harder. When budgets go south, it's very difficult. Those are some of the first things that get cut. So we're constantly wor working at trying to defend that time for teachers to work together. That's the hardest part. Change is hard for teachers. Um, when I arrived at Lathers in the fall of 13, um, and I had been at Lathers when it was K-6 for seven years, so I, you know, I had a background in that school, but being that it was now a pre-K, -K, it was a very different building. Um, and I had been also at a third and fourth grade building prior to that. So um, we had to build some consensus. We had to do a lot of uh, just educating my staff, sharing some uh, relevant articles, uh, visiting some districts that were successfully implementing. We actually visited um, Mr. Whiston's old district. We visited Dearborn. Um, I had a contact through my own superintendent at that time um, who happened to know the deputy super, superintendent there. I needed a district that was not only doing a good job with daily five in kindergarten, but a district that was also had also adopted Reader's Writer's Workshop. Daily five, when you <coughs> read that book written by the sisters, it is a great book, but the gist of the book, you could see that working with third graders. You could see that working with second. We purchased a DVD from the sisters that was just kindergarten. We also visited only kindergarten classes in Dearborn in a couple of schools. For my teachers to be able to go there and visit a classroom and ask some questions and debrief, much more valuable than me sending them to a workshop. Those are hit or miss. Seeing real teachers working with real kids in a classroom made all the difference because it empowered them. Hey, if a neighboring district can do this, we can do this. My teachers are phenomenal, phenomenal teachers. They just needed to be equipped and empowered to do what they knew really was best for kids. So we're there now and we're continuing to improve every step of the way. We haven't arrived, we are just very data driven. And I, I came into a school that was not data driven. And the very first year that I was there, we didn't begin implementation until January. Uh, and we had our DRA scores. We knew what our DRA scores were um, you know, from the previous June. So then we did our DRA in January, we saw where we were and then we got those back at the end of May. My teachers were amazed at that progress and that one, um, this one chart here tells you what we looked like back in um, 2013 and 2014. It tells you what our scores looked like. Um, so what happened then that following fall, we knew that we had made great gains just from January to June, but how much more amazing would it be if we were all on the same page in September, what would we see? So we gave that DRA score, that's kind of our, our big measure of how, how well we're doing mid-year. Oh my goodness, they were excited because it was looking good. And this was just our first full year. I have never seen teachers who really were not data-driven so eager to get those end of May scores back. They were so excited and the, you know, the results were as amazing as we were expecting. So I'm just so happy that my teachers are on board. Um, our children are the benefit, you know, the, the, the people who are benefiting from this change and our district ultimately too because we're moving kids into first grade ahead of the game in many cases instead of behind All right. the game. So we're going to go to Tom, then Nikki, and then Michelle. So how do you, uh, thank, thank you for coming to your presentation. How do you know when a kid is, uh, a child is seriously struggling? 
Lindsay and Larissa. <laughs> At the very beginning of the year, we do some baseline testing to see where our children are coming in. Um, what we then do is we start catering our instruction. We have our pacing guide. We know exactly what we need to teach, but we're doing whole group and teaching the structure for daily five in the first 25 days, and then we move right into those small groups. Now, mind you, at the very beginning, all of our small groups are low. <laughs> they're, they're still learning letters and sounds. Um, we start using, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's Jan Richardson. She has um, a guided reading in instruction. She teaches you exactly what to do at each level. Um, she's paired with Pioneer Valley and the materials are amazing. So we start working with our children on the letters, the sounds, sorting, um, writing the letters, teaching them what it is that they need to do to master those letters. Once they hit 40 letters, they know 40 letters out of 52 uppercase, lowercase, we move them into a level so A. seriously struggling would be one that's not. So, so through the year too, we also have different cut points that show where students should be, you know, at the beginning of the year. Where should they be in no January? Yeah. Okay. Um, and and so, then, so you pull these kids out for MTSS? Right. And uh, so once we identify students who are struggling based on those cut scores, then they're able to receive Title I services for reading. Um, what would they be doing otherwise if they weren't? I mean, what are the other kids doing? If they're, they're in those centers, centers where they're working on writing, okay. they're working on reading to a partner, they're listening to reading. So all of the children are immersed in literacy. Okay. Are they getting like satisfactory, unsatisfactory grades or anything like that? Um, so their report card right now is based on standards. So um, it shows whether kids are meeting grade level expectations or whether they're not. Um, and the kids who are approaching grade level expectations. So we're able to tailor our interventions based on you know, those report card scores, their assessment scores throughout the year. And then students are able to move in and out of intervention services as well. So I may have a student for six weeks or so. If they meet those grade level expectations, then they're able to go back into their classroom for regular so what, instruction. What if a child isn't ready to read? Then we just keep working with them at their level. We have lots of hands-on materials. We're working with the letters. We're working with building the, their name. I mean, what if they just want to play? Or maybe well, they want to have a you know, I mean, you know, I've, uh, we've had Dr. Zhao in before, and he said you can teach a kid to read at any level, pretty at any grade, but you may end up causing them to hate reading for the rest of their lives. I mean, how, you know, I mean, there's, a, and he talks about how we kill creativity a lot of times mm -hmm. in kids by, you know, forcing them to do things that, you know, they, maybe they just want to be creative and experiment and play and, you know, is there, is there a little bit too much, I mean, could there be too much focus on data and too much focus on, I, on trying to force them into things that maybe they're just not ready to I think many many of us, we're very fortunate, many of us that teach kindergarten have our early childhood certifications. So we, we have developmental background knowledge and expertise. Um, we ensure that our children go outside for recess first thing in the morning block. We have their lunch recess and playtime. We do it in the afternoon. We do music and movement breaks. We are constantly coming up with fun ways to get the kids being creative. Um, when we do a read aloud and we're reading a book, we're asking them what they can relate to it. And then they're getting to go and if they don't feel like writing about it, they draw. And then we ask them up. I mean, we are constantly just, trying to find ways to I would want to make sure creative. a child doesn't think that they, I mean, a, a seriously struggling kindergartner it just doesn't sound right to me. I don't know, you know, kids, uh, I don't know. I just, you know, I just want to, I would just want to make sure that they are not thinking that they're behind or something. Maybe they're just not ready to read right now or maybe, you know, I, I don't know. There's a, there's so, a wide range of developmental um, levels in kindergarten. So we had a teacher, one of my, my most phenomenal teachers was very worried about this one little boy. And um, he had a, a mom that had three little ones and worked, and she was not going to be the mom that was able to do all of the, we have a red reading folder, read every day folder. She was not able to do those. She, he was seriously, you know, falling behind because by March, we do expect him to be at a, at a certain point. Um, but developmentally, I think with him, a lot of it was, like you said, Tom, he just wasn't ready. And you'll see what happens in kindergarten is when they are ready, they're exposed to all of this quality instruction. And for some of them, it just doesn't connect and it doesn't click until they are ready developmentally. For some, that happens in November. For others, it doesn't happen until March or April. We keep working, we keep exposing them. And if you look at some of the pictures in that little folder, 
um, you're going to see what it really looks like. I think a lot of times they think they're playing. They do. <laughs> and they think it's a cool <laughs> game on the they iPad, but it's really reinforcing their letter understanding and their phonemic awareness. So for them, it's a game. It's truly in a game format. Um, and if you walked in mid-morning, you would see in um, at least half of my rooms around 1030, they're up and moving and dancing, and it's called a brain break. But they're actually learning. I, I walked in the other day, and they were singing and dancing to the numbers. They were counting by tens, and they counted, you know, groups, one set of ten, two sets of ten. They were learning math, but if you ask them what they were doing, they'd say, I'm having fun and I'm dancing. Um, but if you ask their teacher, she would tell you what standard they're working on. All right, so Nick, it's, it's all in the approach. Thank you. Yeah. Nikki, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I feel like I should uh, correct Eileen and just be clear, because I did not visit Garden right. City Schools, right. but Mary Pantier. You Mary. Right. Yes, she did uh, reach out to me, and she was the previous administrator. Yes. And she was very proud of running a tight ship and, like you said, Susan, putting her money into her kids. Right. Absolutely. So I think that was a huge starting point for everything that happened. Um, I'm careful. I'm careful to credit the standards, not because I don't think that setting high expectations is an important thing to do. I do that for my own kids. I think it has an impact on our kids. But you bring about probably, in my opinion, the most important part of your presentation was the solid instruction, the quality instruction, right. the methods that you used. Those were all around well before <coughs> 2010. Orton Gillingham, uh, Daily Five. Right. Those things were there. So. For you guys to pick them up was wonderful, I think, in general, I guess, as a response to the standards, that could be it, or it could just be done, because mm -hmm. they were there before. And putting a focus on kids that have special needs, thank you for being here, um, is very important. Um, and not every school district is doing that. Um, and I think that we often say, well, where's the money to do it? So, you know, I, I'm thinking about just sort of how do you do that? Um, and it sounds like Mary just did it, but there is something behind doing it. Um, the budget skills, it's like a, having a toolbox and choosing to use whatever you use when you use it. Um, I think about Dave Ramsey and how he has his baby steps towards you know, financial freedom, if you will. Could you guys put something like that together in terms of what's behind yep. budget, Michelle, even if it includes grants that other school districts could look at? Maybe they don't adopt the exact same thing. They have the freedom and the local control to do it. But they look at what you've done. They look at the methods that you've put in place that were well in use long, long time before. And, and I, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Why did we move away from, from those proven methods and that evidence-based practice? Um, I think we call it evidence-based practice now because we have the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Data is somewhat, um, you know, useful, if you will. But it was all there before, so um, why we moved to whole language is an interesting concept. But anyhow, um, beyond that, do you have something that you could give other school districts that we could help them see why you did what you did and how you did what you did with your grant money? I think it looks different for every building, though, because school improvement is there for every building. So Mary's building... Her budget and her choices of how she would use her allocation looked very different than mine. And ultimately, if you talk to the 5-6 principal or the 3-4, it's really based on what your team discusses and what your building needs. So when we were beginning this process, I was in a building that did not have a lot of level books. Mary had a lot of level books. The resources at the 1-2 campus were huge and phenomenal. They have like a huge section of their library set up for teachers to go. It's like a borrowing library. And they also had a lot in their classrooms. We had really limited resources. Mary hired, just, just an example, she would hire three reading teachers. Now she's got a full two grade building. She's grant funded for two grades. I'm grant funded only for kindergarten um, for the title and at risk. I would have loved three reading teachers. However, I needed books to read. So it came down to what looked practical for us, and we also needed a lot of PD. We needed to grow in our learning of what these best practices were and how they would look and how they would be implemented. But Alex can comment some more on that too. And I, again, I'll try to be brief because I know we're running over. Um, the, uh, the magic that happens in classrooms happens because of teachers, okay? And that's, you know, there's not a single principal out there that grades the papers and teaches the reading. <coughs> um, but the principals are the ones who do drive the data, who create the conversations about it. They're the instructional leaders in the building. Um, Mary Pantier was a wonderful principal in Garden City. Um, and in the beginning, uh, Mary and I did, we butted heads a little bit. Um, and uh, she's, she's a very determined individual. 
Um, but it really came about us learning together and growing in this PLC system, this using data to collaborate, using research to figure out what is best for students. So I, as a, as a, from a district standpoint, we are loose and tight. We're extremely tight about the process. You will use school improvement provided to us the, by the MDE that says uh, gather, study, plan, and do. You use the data, you work the process, and you get better every year. And once that enters in, once Mary grabbed onto data, that's where Mary started to tailor exactly how she was going to spend mm -hmm. that money, right. exactly how what, what what services they're going to provide for those students, and why they also made great gains. This is just lab. This is just one of the buildings right. in the this district. Just, we show you third grade others. scores. Right. So I mean, this is something that we're doing in every building, and every building's in a different level of that process. But again, loose and tight, tight on the process, loose on the how. Teachers and principals decide on the how. So you have, I mean, the presentation showed us how much improvement you guys have had in comparison to other school districts and mm -hmm. even statewide. Um, just putting something together for school districts to be able to look at what you've done and why you've done it. Sure, we're, we're happy. Yep. You guys can contact us. You have all, Marilyn uh, Snyder has all of our contact information. If you would ever like us to share more in depth or if there's a particular district or a group that you know of that would like some information from us, we're more than willing. And another thing we'd love to highlight is our kindergarten connections because honestly, I can tell you that if we did not have that strong component that we also put into place when we made these changes in 2013. Um, meeting the needs of the whole child has to happen at this level. And um, we can do that through that social work piece. And that's also something that we have at every single building in our district. So I think the two go hand in hand because if a child comes to you with so much trauma and so much crisis in their little lives, how do you get them to learn how to read? How do you get them to learn their math facts in third grade if their home trauma is so severe that they can't focus? Right. So. Is this something so that we, good yeah. for the partnership model as well? Yeah, the that? partnership model and we're creating a uh, best practices warehouse where we can say to districts, if you're looking for a program to uh, improve reading scores or writing yes. scores, here's what you need to look at and then we can highlight you know, this program so districts can go investigate it. So that's the kind of the the goal behind the promising practices so that Absolutely. districts can learn from each other. So yeah. that's something we're working on putting together. Yeah, we visited a district many years ago. Um, Ypsilanti had a very similar model at their Perry, Perry school that's like, wait a minute, it's pre-K, K-1. It's a little different uh, configuration than us. But I spent a lot of hours meeting with that principal and they have a very strong social work component. And we modeled our component after what they have because I will tell you that my behavior data, I mean, I, I collect all kinds of data. My behavior data showed us that we absolutely have to have this in place. And at our level, I have a very large DSRP program. Um, I have 160 at-risk four-year-olds in my program. My at-risk four-year-olds and my five-year-olds are serviced by this Kindergarten Connections in-school social worker. Um, those are not like social workers that deal with children with IEPs or special needs. These are just children who are having some uh, difficulty adjusting to school. When you really get to the bottom of the story, it's something that's happened in the child's family and something they've been exposed to. We've seen a hu huge increase in Garden City of children who are coming to school at age four and five who have been exposed to extreme crisis, um, extreme trauma. They've either experienced it themselves or they've witnessed it. And when children come to school that way, they are not what you would consider a normal four or five year old. They bring that baggage with them and it comes out in very unpredictable um, and frightening ways in the classroom, on the playground, in the lunchroom, in the line. Um, and it's just that their little, their little body and their little um, emotions don't know how to cope with all the things that they've experienced. So we have a social worker that is an expert at working with those kids and she pulls them in small groups. And she has a little group for four year olds that's all about anger management, believe it or not. She has one for impulsivity, and it's called remote control. How do we, how do we make those better choices? What are some things we usually do? Okay, what could we do instead? And they're little game format lessons. But our, um, our surveys at the end of the year from parents who have kids who participated in that have actually said, my child was able to learn because they were able to manage these impulses and these behaviors. If your child is having those behaviors, they a lot of times can't stay in school if it's that severe. So we're, we just think, again, that balanced approach, not just balanced literacy, but meeting the needs of the whole child. Um, the child can't read and do math if they're burdened by those emotional um, 
Yeah. All right, we have just a couple of minutes. We have Michelle and then Richard. Absolutely, um, we'd love to have you. Island of Detroit, right oh, with close by. Yeah, um, yeah. So I would, I would like to to do that. But um, and uh, it, it sounds really fascinating to me. The the, the one question I did have was, um, I'm thinking. So you've had to invest. I think the choices where you've invested sound really sound mm -hmm. and um, uh, and paid off. Uh, what have you had to sacrifice? And uh, is in order to get that is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get. At. Maybe that's something I need to kind of see. But and then they also, they also had a question. <laughs> this will be it. Um, do you have an issue with absenteeism? How do you deal with absenteeism? And how do you? And, and also, um, I, I realize I, it's, it's hard for me to contain myself with my questions. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, uh, and if there, and if you, how do you do the paperwork for the special ed? the assessments and all that kind of stuff if your social worker is dedicated there. How, so I, I understand that's where you put the resources mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I want to see it and get a better understanding but um, if I could generalize my questions. Uh, well for the resources I think it kind of goes back to our previous answer is that um, your question was what do we have to give up? So it's, it's really um, that group consensus. So this past year or let's say at the end of the spring every year we go through what we're planning for the upcoming year. And it's really a group meeting of, do we want to hire two full-time reading teachers or do we want one reading teacher and a ton of resources in PD? So I, I don't know that I look at it as what I had to give up because it's a choice we made. Some years we said, we really need those resources. So I would say two years ago, three years ago, it was all about, yes, we need our solid reading teacher, but we need those books, we need the materials. I need to equip my teachers with you know, the things that they need for the children who aren't meeting the, the benchmarks. So I, I've never looked at it as what I'm having to give up or what I've lost. It's a it's a group decision. We build consensus, and then we and then we go with it. And we don't gripe about it the next year, like oh, I really wish I had three teachers this year. We know we don't have three teachers because we all voted on one teacher. <laughs> but look at all this other stuff we got with that one teacher. So, um, and then your question about truancy and um, you know attendance issues, we have a few, but I would say in Garden City overall, it's not. Um, <laughs> We handle them at the kindergarten level very much on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, I think probably just as frustrating as kids coming in late. Um, they're missing a little bit of that early morning instruction and that early morning settling in time, but uh, you really just have to work with those families and let them know the importance and try and find out is there a root problem that's really preventing this child from coming. And sometimes it involves a help team meeting where you've got quite a few people and let, letting them know that your child is struggling because they're missing so much exposure to the curriculum. Is there Your child, any, yeah. Um, feedback, I guess I know with the parents. So sometimes they start these kids in kindergarten at like seven thirty in the morning or something. I mean, is there ever any adjustment? Listening to the to the parents and listening to the teachers and then the administrators adjusting based on, on what uh, changing policy based on what teachers and, uh, and the parents say. We haven't had a lot of opportunity for that, mainly because we are a configured district the way we are. It's all it's all about that bus schedule. We're a late start building. Our school doesn't start until 8:50, so for kindergartners that's pretty doable. And uh, but but the the opposite of that is that we don't get out until 4:05. And you know what little ones are like from yes. two to four. Yeah. So that's why we're very careful about, especially in the fall, what are we doing in the afternoon? We're very careful about the kind of instruction we're doing because they're pretty fatigued and they have to build up that stamina for that full day and that full day of um, more of an academic program. So we work on that. Right. Sure, sure. Richard, please, then we're going to move on. A couple of just quick questions. What's your average teacher tenure? Well, um, my average teacher tenure. <coughs> Just ballpark, you know. I would. I have a fairly young staff. Mm -hmm. I would say the average in Jesus. my building might be eight years. Kindergarten is higher than GSLP, so kindergarten alone might yeah. be a little higher. Yeah. Okay, so maybe maybe twelve years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I overall, um, I have a, a much younger staff, and um, yeah, that shows in the amount of evaluations I do every year. Okay. <laughs> I just wondered, as, as you make the transition, is there much uh, uh, any any out of the ordinary traf, uh, staff um, uh, turnover or anything like that? 
No, I would say initially, um, I can't remember who asked that other question. Uh, initially, when we made some of these changes, we did have a few folks that were looking at retirement in the very near future, and some of them did choose to leave maybe a year earlier than they would have um, because they were not, they just, they were not in, they were not in favor, they were not on board, and they did not see themselves being a contributor and a person who could implement this new way of teaching. And um, they were, they were wonderful people, but they had to be on board. Sure. They had to be on board with what we were doing. Staffing so. is always a challenge, and we are a deficit district. Um, we're making great strides to get out of deficit, but our human resources department has to cut it so razor thin and those adjustments. And sometimes Susan has ended up with someone who came in that uh, from third grade or from grade. Uh, music teacher. Yeah. And that's where the staff collaboration is essential uh -huh. uh, because what you just saw in that video was master teaching. And we expect that of all of our teachers, but the only way a teacher gets there is with support yeah. and support from each other and that time to learn. Yeah, I had a teacher that came to me in kindergarten last year who had taught 21 years in music at grades five and six, and she landed in kindergarten last year. So to say the least, she was a little bit shell-shocked because the children are about that high rather than that high, and you're not doing fun, cool songs and concerts and instruments. You're teaching them letters and letter sounds, um, and just running a classroom rather than running those um, those specials. But she's phenomenal. She's, you know, with the help of that whole team, she is figuring it out, and um, she is growing by leaps and bounds. When I see her this year, so amazed compared to that shell-shocked teacher that I saw last year. But at the end of the year, her kids landed right where they needed to be because she understood what the importance was. And what she said to me is she came to me, I think it was about mid-year. She said, Susan, if I get better at this small group guide in reading, that's where I'm going to make the biggest difference. And for her to see that so quickly, having not been a grade level classroom teacher, the light went on, absolutely. If you can work in small groups with those little ones and help them with those phonemic awareness skills and help them with the comprehension and help them with those strategies, absolutely. And I think that's why your kids landed where they did. Our key is collaboration. It really, it, like for a it music really teacher that's been teaching, you know, as long as she has, and for a third grade teacher, a fifth grade teacher to be able to come to our building and not know how to do guided reading with five-year-olds, um, it, the key in our building is collaboration. It, it really is. We have a very strong collaborative set right. culture. Yeah. Um, we give up everything and anything we can to help sure. our colleagues and to help our students. I have kids that come to me for guided reading from other classrooms, and we don't look at the children in our classroom as our children. Every child in our building is my child. Mm -hmm. I have to do what I can to make sure the kids in your room and the kids in your room get where they need to be because that's the entire purpose of being an educator is to help all of these children succeed. And just like it, when we started our new process, I did send my teachers over to the Dearborn Public Schools to see some good quality um, daily five and readers writers workshop models over there. But likewise, when I get a teacher that's new to my grade level, I am sending them right into my classrooms with my most experienced teachers because an observation of a good teacher doing that good kind of instruction is going to get me so much more than paying for a workshop that I may or may not get that end result from. So we do a lot of, um, we, watch, we watch model teachers doing model lessons and, and, and learn a lot from each other that way. Collective All right, responsibility. thank you. Great place to end it. Well, yeah. ask a rhetorical yep. question. Yep, please. <laughs> How did the Dearborn District get so good? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. lucky. Thank you very much for being here, and thank, thank you for the work you're so doing much. in the thank classroom. You appreciate, you. appreciate you. Appreciate, appreciate you being here and sharing with us the good work. Next item on the agenda is presentation on the 21st Century Education Commission. The 21st Century Education Commission was announced during the Governor's <laughs> State of the State in January 2016 and formerly created by Executive Order 2016-6. The commission was chaired by Dr. Thomas Haas, president of Grand Valley State University. It included a diverse a group of administrators, teachers, unions, uh, early childhood experts, charter school leaders, business leaders, higher education representatives. Several around this table played a role. Uh, Eileen Weiser, John Austin, Cassandra, and Richard came in at the near the end, and of course I participated. Uh, also, commissioners in attendance are Dave Campbell, Superintendent of Kalamazoo 
Risa and Doug Ross, president of American Promise Schools. So, Dr. Ross, if you could come forward and present to the board, please. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. This is a great time of year in my world. <clears throat> in 10 days, we're going to graduate about 5,000 people. Yay. And uh, we're thrilled because most of them are staying here right in New Michigan, so that's good too. Let me uh, say uh, thank you first uh, to you all for this opportunity. Thank you for your leadership uh, in this very important uh, space with uh, K through 12. But noted uh, that it really is a continuum, uh, and that's why this particular commission, I think, was uh, conceived to understand that continuum of uh, uh, pre, uh, really P20. Uh, was uh, significant, so we can pass those along that way. Um, let me take one uh, minute and just describe who I am. Uh, in addition to being uh, President Grand Valley, I'm going to start my 12th year uh, here shortly. I've uh, been uh, pleased to uh, be part of Michigan. My first assignment when I was in the Coast Guard in 1970 was on the Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac. Oh. And so I've been part of uh, Michigan for quite a number of years, uh, U of M grad and all, but uh, I started off, though, in New York City uh, in very uh, <coughs> modest conditions, I would say, because my mom and dad didn't graduate from high school. My mom made it through fourth grade, and my dad left uh, to go into the service when he was 16. He decided that he could change his birth certificate so he can go into the Navy during World War II. But uh, we, uh, we were able to... Uh, uh, go through public schools in New York City uh, and then uh, I had to seek a way to get to college. Uh, we did have uh, a very strong um, value on education even though my folks did not attend uh, and go through a, a, um, a to an end of a, a diploma or a degree and so I was able to go into the Coast Guard and spent uh, uh, 23 years of commission service, uh, but getting into education, I've been teaching actually now for 40 years, and still do. I love teaching freshman chemistry, but I also teach strategy in the advanced courses that we have at Grand Valley. So I'm an educator in my core, but I also have a, a wife of 43 years who went to Albion College, and uh, I learned from her how important it is uh, to be a good teacher because that's what she did in her profession. Uh, from early childhood to special ed, uh, and everything in between, and I learned a lot from her. Uh, and I think, uh, I just want to put that, that in context. So, um, let me uh, talk about the process, and then I have uh, two of my colleagues and other colleagues around the table, and hi uh, Brian. Uh, so, uh, we'll be uh, able to answer any questions that you might have, and but put it in perspective, as uh, Brian was uh, mentioning, we had a commission that was established through executive order. Uh, we, um, and I got a call actually from John Walsh back in June uh, saying the governor wants you to serve. I said, sure. He said, I want you to chair. I said, when does it do? And uh, with that, he said, the end of February. And I said, well, let's get started then. And uh, we did. In July, we had our first meeting uh, with a very eclectic, very wonderful group of professionals uh, with uh, strong um, experiences uh, that I was hopeful and that hope was sustained throughout the process that we could deliver a transformative plan uh, for the state of Michigan, a framework really that we could use or the policy makers could use as you here are in that role uh, to uh, help transform this state with its understanding that education is a true means to uh, uh, develop an educated citizen uh, for our state and beyond. And so we got started and uh, we, we met uh, here in Lansing um, and our last meeting was actually here in this room in February. And so in that first meeting, and Eileen, you remember, we, we went around the table who we were uh, and who we represented and um, we uh, were quick to come to the resolve that we were not going to whine about the past. In fact, we took 10 minutes and after that, we didn't whine anymore. And I think that was a good approach because what we wanted to do is lean forward. Lean forward with uh, 
our collective thoughts and perspectives and needs, and we started looking at, uh, well, we, we see this uh, executive order. It gives us the charge and charter uh, to do what we needed to do. And then we focused in on creating a vision. And that vision is incorporated uh, right here in, in the plan that, that you have in front of you. And um, that, that particular vision uh, was um, um, leaning forward in many <coughs> regards uh, and, and basically saying this state must have a world-class education system. It's a system. <coughs> so what I wanted to do with the group then is uh, use uh, some um, uh, principles on what's called design thinking. And design thinking is um, a process that I've used in strategic planning for probably 30 years. And it really focuses in on outcomes and results. It focuses in on the uh, individuals or the groups that are going to be impacted by the system as a whole. And so it was remarkable when we went around the table, the North Star became the child or the student. That was the North Star that we wanted to create and build this framework upon and give them the tools to take us forward because our investments today become tomorrow's reality. That, that's an important feature, that the decisions we make today become tomorrow's reality. And so we really focused in on that mission and, and uh, scrubbed it back and forth. And instead of having a continuum approach, this P20, we decided uh, as a group, and we had uh, a good facilitator, and we were going to go outside of just Michigan to find out where the best models are that we could use and steal from. And we did. We looked at Massachusetts. We got Ed Trust in the mix. Uh, we had others come in. We had readings. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would dare say conservatively that our group was an active commission. I would say that we spent collectively 5,000 hours of work over nine months. And it might be more. Because we spent, I, I know personally, I spent a lot of weekends reading and preparing and coming to Lansing once or twice a month. And my colleagues did the same thing because they were committed to this because we were going to touch that future. And as teachers and educators, you know that when we're in the classroom, that's what we do. We touch the future. And it's very noble, the work that you're doing here and that we do across the continuum. And so we we've really uh, did uh, some realignment from a continuum approach, but laying the continuum on the, the ultimate results. But I wanted to get us to talk about accountability, about governance and structure, and about funding. And then uh, we uh, said, okay, gravitate where you want to go. And then I put uh, a person who could be uh, a chair of each one of those groups. And we did the lion's share of the work within those subgroups, and we did what was called catch ball. And periodically, like every month, uh, we would have the groups, and they work offline, they come back, and then we would uh, work within the larger group, go back to the smaller group. And from the design thinking principle, that was a good catch ball back and forth, and we could test each other. And we wanted to, at the end of the day, whatever, we didn't have a conceived notion of the number of recommendations that we would come up with, but we wanted to push towards consensus across this very diverse group of uh, perspectives that, that we had. And so we then um, started looking at some of the principles that would guide our decision making. And we did, and it's in the report. And then uh, we, we and, and actually I'm going to go to that for just one second because those nine principles really define, I think, uh, very broadly what this world-class education system is all about. It's on page 26. And so he, these principles, you focus in on learning, create that uh, culture of success, and build and shape, really, a coherent, connected education system from prenatal to career. And you can see the principles that we, we uh, developed. And again, we, we catch ball it back and forth and back and forth. and then. We assigned those, uh, in many regards, uh, to each one of those groups so that they could then uh, seek models, have conversations from the perspectives that they had, and then develop uh, some drafts that we could then 
uh, chew on and see if they were relevant or not. And oh, by the way, we wanted to also test ourselves against the citizens here in the state of Michigan. So we went to West Michigan. We went to um, uh, the greater Detroit area. We tried to get to Traverse City twice in the wintertime. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, so what we did is we used electronic means. We did that, and then we went to the UP as well. And that, that was uh, helpful because we saw from our citizens that some of their thinking and perspectives, and we had educators, we had parents there, we had uh, administrative people, we had business leaders, and they were all aligning themselves so well, not just with the principals, but as we developed some of our recommendations, we heard that come out too. And so I was really, really pleased with how we were coalescing and how we were developing that trust with this group of 25 of us as we went forward. But we did uh, hit one point in the process that uh, we were uh, needing a timeout. And so with that, we said, let's really concentrate in October, I think it was, and we brought everyone over to Grand Rapids um, and we had a retreat to see where we were and see where we're going again. And I think that those types of timeouts in this, in this design thinking process is very, very helpful as we move to hand. But also, always keeping though, the student and the child in mind. Every time we, and we had a couple of people on the commission, they were great. Uh, you know, everyone, uh, you, you've all been involved, you, you have this right around this table too. Certain people take responsibilities for certain um, behaviors of the group and so we had a good conscience for a few people, keeping us on track. Uh, my role was uh, really uh, with the facilitator is to uh, uh, keep us uh, moving ahead uh, with this vision that we had. And so what I was uh, pleased with is we had the inputs, we had the give and takes. Uh, uh, we, we were working very, very diligently, <coughs> even though I was getting some pushback saying, Tom, we need more time. <laughs> and I said, when the Admiral tells a Coast Guard guy, in this case, the governor tells me, that it's due on the 28th of February, Dave, the response was? It's due February 28th. Yes. <laughs> so that's what we did. And I think uh, we, did we have to compromise along the way? I'll, I'll tell you, there was one area that we wish we could have done, but I didn't think it was in the charter, and that was workforce development. And the, the notion of workforce development, because the governor put together these three commissions, and the last one, I'm, I think it's coming to a close here before we know it, is uh, on uh, economic development. The first one was on infrastructure, education, and economic development. So we kind of pushed that one over. Uh, because we wanted to really focus in on this model, this set of guidelines and principles that policymakers could use in this space of education. And then two epiphanies happened after the retreat. Um, one was, where's the call to action? And my other colleague uh, here at the table was very, very good about pressing us as a commission that we needed this call to action. We needed a set of tangible, measurable goals. All of our 32 recommendations, all achieved with consensus, gave us that way forward for the next 10 years. But what about the next two or three or five years? What about the call to action and measurable results? And with that, we took the uh, work to date and we had uh, uh, Doug and some others come together and create that call to action. And then, oh, by the way, uh, we also needed to look at the funding uh, models that go along with each at the, as best we could. And then we also needed to prioritize in, in some kind of fashion what's uh, uh, right now, what's intermediate, what's long term. And this particular framework now provides that. The other epiphany that, that I have, that I had through the process, uh, and then we'll open it up for, for questions, but I'm going to have Doug uh, uh, say a few words uh, as well when I finish. It was really clear that I've been in the public education space 
for my entire career, except for two years when I was in Iowa at a private college where I was a provost. I learned a lot in that space, too, but it also redoubled my understanding that investments in public education are critical to the nation's security. Not just the state, but an educated citizen is critical to our national security. So I went ahead and I wanted to uh, see in the Constitution in 1963, where does education raise its stature? And it does. I, I pulled it out um, and uh, uh, in 1963 it says uh, Article 8, and uh, you've read this I'm sure, in the first section, education, uh, encouragement of education, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools, and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. That's in the 63 Constitution. Well, I decided, well, that's in the 63. Where did it really begin? And it began in 1787 in the Northwest Ordinances, and that identical language verbatim is there. This state, even before it came a state, knew how important public education was. It's a public good, ladies and gentlemen, and I've been saying that throughout my entire career. Education is a public good, meaning we need to continue to invest in that public good. And it's critical that we are at a junction right now because when we got the displays, and I'm not here to do a public, I could do public, uh, you know, uh, PowerPoints and all that, but the, it was really clear from Education Trust, we got to get started. We're leaving behind scores of students, of people, of citizens. That's a, we, we can't do that. We have a responsibility. We have responsibility to the future. We have a responsibility to those young people, and it starts in prenatal going all the way through 20. And that's why I was very pleased as I started to be with some wonderful people at our commission. The commissioners really understood that we had an opportunity with our decisions to inform that future in a very positive way, to help policymakers, as yourself and others here in the state, in the legislature, in the governor's office, informed by our citizens who we're serving, to make a difference in this state. And we got to get started now. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop, turn it over to Doug for a minute, and then. Uh, uh, would you want to, uh, at the end of Doug, say a word or two, and then we'll uh, open it up, please. Thank you. Well, first, thank you for this opportunity to come here with uh, Tom and Dave. Uh, with your leave, I'd like to take literally three minutes to focus on one part of the commission report, which is the discussion of governance and the future of the State Board of Education, something we talked about. We talked about you quite a bit. For public education in MOOC, to move from among the worst performing systems in the U.S. and the development world, developing world, to one of the best, the Commission believed that we needed a powerful bipartisan strategy. And the reason it had to be bipartisan is, everywhere we looked, it took a decade or more to dramatically <coughs> redirect a public education system. And so that means that whatever that strategy is, it has to survive partisan changes in government. States that reverse direction every four or eight years don't get very far, Michigan being an excellent example. So potentially, given this need for bipartisanship, we saw the board as an ideal venue for such a strategy because after all, you always have both Democrats and Republicans, even ideally, at least from my perspective, maybe not yours, it's 4-4. Four, four. I mean, you almost can't do anything without a bipartisan agreement. Um, and after all, the governor is by definition always a partisan. So this is a particularly hopeful venue. 
And no one in the commission doubted the sincere commitment of each member of this board to providing kids in this state with a quality public education. However, the commission was concerned that the board could at any point produce this strong bipartisan state strategy. And we were concerned for two reasons. Well, first, the members of the state board are nominated by the most ideologically partisan political institutions in the state, the state conventions of the two political parties. If board members compromise the platform and the interest group positions of their nominating party too frequently, they risk losing their party's nomination next time around, which makes finding common ground across partisan lines difficult. Uh, as a former elected official, I know how hard it is to depart from your party's core views on an issue. Secondly, neither party's central strategy, more resources for Democrats, more choice for Republicans, has by itself been the path to high performance for any of the education competitors around the world that we looked at who are leaving us in their dust. So unless board members are willing to move beyond their party's platforms, the board is not likely to be the source of the long-term bipartisan school strict reform strategy our state so urgently requires. Now, speaking now just for myself, I think this members of this commission would be delighted, eager, uh, to have the members of the state board come together and take the lead in looking at what the best in the world are doing to prepare their children for this high knowledge economy and tailor it for Michigan. It's, it, it's, it's what we took a first shot at trying to do in this report. We are not so immodest to believe that our uh, proposed blueprint for Michigan is the only one or even the best one. However, if the State Board of Education continues to simply advocate multiple partisan agendas, rather than forge a consensus strategy, we believe that calls to either eliminate the board or grant the governor the power to appoint its members will continue to grow. Thank you. David? My comments would, would revolve around, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got a little handout um, that I'd like to, to pass out here. And I, I feature the <coughs> executive order. The executive order really is the groundwork. And, that, and what makes this a, uh, what made the commission, I think, a, a so powerful was not only the bipartisan nature and the, the commitment to research, there was not a strong political tone in the room, but it was, the, it was the, the idea, the charge of the commission was governance, funding, and accountability. What is working around the country and around the world? So that's in the charge of the executor. So this isn't a... Uh, a personal conversation. This is okay. We're being called to research what is working in top performing states and nations as it relates to governance, funding, and accountability. And of course, governance systems are what bring things to reality or not. Okay, and so I, I compliment Superintendent Wiston on, on the ESSA submission. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of good stuff in the in the ESSA plan. Can it be brought to fruition through our incoherent systems of governance? Oh no, we don't have a good track record of that. It's one of the reasons why we're 50th in the country in, in academic growth and in, in reading growth in our, in, our, in our fourth graders, is the bringing things to scale. So when you start talking to, to administrators, uh, school leaders in, in the Massachusetts of the world, the Minnesotas, the Ontarios, if you want to go global, although that's awfully close, a lot closer than Minnesota, uh, you, you, you hear a different tone. You hear more collaboration you hear more cohesion, you hear less politics, less adult fighting, more focusing on children. In speaking to the superintendent of Montreal one time, uh, he knew so much more about third grade math instruction than any school leader I've talked with in Michigan simply because their system is designed for the school leaders to focus on teaching and learning. It was remarkable how the detailed knowledge uh, that he had. So the executive order is very important. And then just as a kind of a, a, an example of the kinds of conversations we had, we do research. So you go to the Education Commission of the state's website, and I included that there in your, your handout, and you start to look at, well, how are state boards 
uh, elected, selected, or appointed, or if, if states have them. And in another part of the, the executive order that I really appreciate was the, the piece on culture, uh, the, 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 the cultural uh, background of states. And I loved how Dr. Haas highlights the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. It is relevant. We are a Midwestern state that was founded on the idea of townships, and townships have a section 16, don't they? You remember that in fourth grade social studies? Yes, I was a social studies teacher. Uh, in section 16, there's a public school. So very early on in our history, we were committed to all kids getting an education. Do you see that in the South? Do you see that in the, in the West? Not so much. These are very different governance structures around our country. And so doing comparisons is hard, which is why I listed a number of different states. And of course, we would want to invent something on our own that really fits Michigan well. But there are different ways of having state boards, if states choose to have them. You can see two of our, of our uh, Midwestern uh, neighbors, Wisconsin and Minnesota, don't. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't. Indiana's the fastest growing state in the Midwest. Also a Northwest Ordinance, Northwest Ordinance state. Also has the countywide, uh, the, 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 the type of governance structures that we have. They do have them. How are they chosen? Just listed some for you. You can go to that website and see others. And so it was, it was that type of research. And then what are the structures, what conversations do they produce? The sad thing about what's happened to our state board, and this is not personal in any way, as I've told many of you around the table in, the, in months past, is you've, you've, frankly, you've been depowered. And you know that through executive orders over the last couple of decades. So it's no one person's fault. This is, this is a decades. The, 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 you've, been, you've been depowered, and so now there are areas that really probably should be under your area of responsibility, but you don't have that. It just, and it just feels very much like it's time to update the system. And if you're going to update a system, you start at the top and you work your way down. And that's what the commission report does, starting with the state board at the top and the Department of Education, then your regional entities, then your local districts, and your charter schools. So there's five recommendations in there that were pretty thoughtfully done. A lot more research is needed. Okay, I, that's why I wanted more time. Uh, but, and, and we understand there's always a limit on time. But there's a sequence to these things, and it should be done very carefully and thoughtfully because we could end up creating something even more inco incoherent than what we have now. And sometimes that's hard for me to imagine uh, as, a, as a, a practicing educator in the state for, for several decades. Um, so those are just some, some opening thoughts there. I also put a couple of quotes in from some national thought leaders uh, about the government of the, that, are, that are experts in the area of governance. Um, Michael Petrelli uh, from Fordham Institute talking about how there's so many cooks in the kitchen you can't possibly hold anybody accountable. So we're 50th in growth. We all know that. You, you, you see these scores. You see the NAEP scores. Who's responsible? Well, you really can't hold yourselves responsible because you don't have enough authority really can't hold Brian responsible because he doesn't have enough authority. Your ISD soups, your local soups, your local boards, who we can just sit there and blame each other all around. And if you look at the top performing states and nations, it's more lined up. There is, there, the, the, it is, it's more coherent. And that is what Michael Petrelli is pointing out. And then Mark Tucker, who we had uh, speak to us in, in September, talks about how the, uh, uh, there's a place where the buck stops <coughs> in top performing states and nations. And, uh, and we have a system where there's so many different people in charge of so many different places, it's just not coherent. And it, and it does impede uh, the bringing effective strategies to scale. And that's the biggest difference between our neighbors in, in Ontario, or a, a top performing nation just across the river. Uh, and what we do is we have a very difficult time bringing effective instructional practices to scale. Well, that would be my thoughts. I, Thank you. Mm -hmm. so All right, we so we'll open it up for questions. We have about 25 minutes for questions. I just want to make a, just a couple of brief comments. One is we're currently doing a crosswalk between the top 10 plan and here. And I think when that's done, you're going to see seven of the nine principles that were adopted in this 21st Century Commission are in the top 10 plan. The two that I think aren't probably are the enhanced accountability and the governance stuff that was discussed. But the other seven I think you find in the top 10 plan. And while that was not designed, in fact, we were very clear with the 21st Century Commission that they wanted to develop their own path. And while they understood <coughs> and appreciated the top 10, they didn't want to start there. They wanted to start with a blank sheet and build what they saw was best. But they went through the same kinds of processes we did when building the top 10. So it's not surprising to see seven of the nine 
are aligned to where we wanted to go in top 10. But we are doing a crosswalk to make sure that we have the components of this 21st century in our top 10 plan. And of course, the board has been very active in helping create and develop that top 10 plan over the past couple of years. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that point. And now we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Cassandra, then Tom. Uh, so thank you for coming and presenting today and for the work that you've done. Um, just as background, there were two members of the board that were on the committee as well as um, Brian, I believe you were on there as well. Non-voting member, but yes. Uh, Eileen uh, was selected to be on the committee and then John Austin, um, as his role as the president of the State Board of Education, was on the committee. When he left in, in December or January 1st, um, Richard and I were technically taking over his position, although it was only for one meeting. So um, we really didn't have a whole lot of input into the document. Um, but I, I'm glad that you raised the one issue that I think is, is um, important. Well, not it, the whole thing is important to the board, but um, the one that's probably confusing for us is this governance issue. Um, so let me start out by asking, have we always been 50th in growth? No, we haven't. So, in fact, this is kind of a recent thing for the state, right? So we used to be kind of in the middle of the states. Well, uh, it was, um, we're, if we look at it 41st, that there's different measures. Ten years ago, we were 28th. Twenty years ago, we were in the top ten. Correct. Right. Yes. So clearly it's not the governance that is having an impact. There's something else going on here, right? So what are the policies that the state has been engaged in over the last 20 years that could explain why we've gone from the top 10 to the bottom 10? I would think that governance is a huge piece of it. It's not so much, although we've actually shown some decline since 2003. We're one of three states that has in reading. Right. But generally, it's not that our kids are being so you know, educated markedly less well than they were 20 years ago. It's that everybody else in the world and the nation has moved up, mm -hmm. which is a governing issue. It's right. a question of what's the strategy? How do you focus resources? How do you mobilize the populace, the education community? So it's about leadership. Yeah. And so, so... So what has happened over the last 20 years that could impact leadership? Term limits, big part, right? Gerrymandering, charter schools. All of these things have had a huge impact. And yet, what you're going after, and you're claiming it's because of partisanship, but you yourself said the governor is, by definition, partisan. So if your intent is to create bipartisanship, why would you allow someone who is, by definition, a partisan to appoint the State Board of Education? I For empowerment would be my answer. I'm sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. To, to empower so that they'd be in sync. I think would be the answer. A lot of the other states, Doug's exactly right. Our performance, we're, we're, we're just stagnant. It's just other states are passing us. So I, I, I always hate it when people say we're dropping like a rock. We're dropping in rankings, but in overall performance, it's pretty flat mm -hmm. over the last 20 years. It's really more, more accurate way to say it. There's a lot of things that impact it. Poverty does. You know, a 15-year a, a recession that our state endured, that certainly has a lot of impact. But a lot of other states don't have embedded in their constitution how they're going to govern. And so they were able to adapt and make some changes more quickly, where in ours it's embedded in the Constitution. This would take a constitutional amendment to actually, you know, to, to begin to restructure. And I want to make sure it's, we're very clear here that the recommendations are not just about the state board. It's just that you'd start at the top if you're going to redesign something, similar to a football program. You'd start at the top. But then it's, it's, it's the Department of Education. Who, who can they hire? What are the compensation systems? What are the compensation structures that we use to recruit and retain people at the Department of Education? It comes up often. And then the ISDs. What are the roles that ISDs play? We need to be reconstituted as well. I mean, this is, this is not, please don't take this just about the state board. It is mm -hmm. not. It's a comprehensive recommendation to update us uh, so that we would, you know, be more able to be more nimble in this global economy and global I, economy that demands I think it. your document is missing the major pieces that really impact public policy regarding education, and that is the governor and the state legislature, who have taken considerable power onto themselves to dictate what happens in our schools 
and yet this document doesn't talk about those things to any great extent. You're talking about governance on the fringe, but the real governance issues that are impacting our schools are kind of ignored in your document. So can you talk a little, was that even a consideration in the, the group? If you're saying that the governor and the legislature and the board have together and separately failed to produce the kind of, uh, and implement the kind of strategy that many of our competitors have, I think we would agree with that. It's shared. One of our problems is just that. Where does the buck stop? Does it stop with the governor? Well, the governor would say, well, gee, I don't, you know, I don't, I can, I don't control the Board of Education, and I sort of do and sort of don't have influence over the Department of Education. The legislature would make some similar claims, and the board quite rightly gets to make an equivalent claim. So the problem that we're raising, or the commission tried to raise, is um, leadership in this area is critical. It ultimately needs to be bipartisan because otherwise you can't sustain any particular direction long enough to be transforming. And so the question we really raised is, or that I tried to raise is, um, as the board, where do you see your role? If you're the ones that produce a strong, persuasive, bipartisan strategy, then in some sense, some power begins to move towards you because it's the place where we come together to try and get something done. Um, but we weren't blaming the board mm -hmm. or the governor or the legislature. We were saying the combination isn't getting us where we need to get. I understand. Let me just answer that real quick and then I'll stop so other people can talk. Um, I think one of the unintended consequences, if you were successful in doing this, is to remove a voice from the conversation. So we may not have the power that should be invested in us. And I think we would agree with that. Um, but the one power that we do have is to impact the conversation. And if you remove us from the equation, or you turn us into yet another committee, uh, you know, assigned by the governor, you have taken that voice away. And so I think you, that's one thing that I, I would encourage you to really think about um, as you're you're suggesting that the state board be eliminated. It, well, in fairness, we didn't really suggest yeah. that. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. okay, yeah. that it, the governor appoint the state yeah. board of education. There, there was options in there, and <clears throat> we're we're done with our work. Right, but you are now still. What, what we're doing is we're coming right. to you all. What what I would suggest. This is uh, just top of mind, um, and and I, I hear what Doug is saying. Uh, you are a state board. You are trustees. If you have a mindset of being a trustee, that means you're going to be stewards. And you can then use that pulpit on focusing in on student outcomes, focusing in on the structures and funding and the investment streams, and taking that to the public. And, and use what you have, but change what you have in terms of the mindset of being trustees of the future. Not going into all the hows, but looking at all the whys associated with it. So uh, this was 25 people from across disciplines, I would call it, giving our best shot for you all to take a look at it and say, now, we've been challenged, maybe so. We also challenged other spaces in the K through 12 world, my world, and post-secondary but what you could do it's up to you but in the next 10 years we can't be where we are in 2027 because it is it, it, there's there's an integrity that I sense in my heart of hearts that we are leaving behind so many citizens in the state of Michigan starting with birth and so uh, I would, uh, you know, put yourself out there, your, your trustees, and use that. Just a thought. Okay, Tom, Pam, then Dr. Z, please. Yeah, thanks for coming. I, um, I've been involved in partisan politics since the 80s, and uh, duked it out with uh, Democrats in the legislature and, and worked with Democrats. Uh, I've been here four months and never seen more bipartisanship 
in a body in the last four months uh, than I have here. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's silly what you're suggesting that there's partisanship here uh, that, you know, really, I've, I've found education and I chaired education. I, I was on the education committee for six years in the legislature. It really breaks down, not partisan lines. It's more authoritarian top down versus those that want local control and believe teachers and parents should be empowered. And so it really is not, uh, I, I have not seen the uh, partisan. I worked with some of the most liberal Democrats uh, in the legislature because they were not authoritarian, they were more uh, local control. Um, and as far as how they're elected at the state conventions, we were just uh, nominated, uh, Nikki and I. These are people that are elected, they're precinct delegates, they are elected by the grassroots, so they really are the voices of the grassroots. And then we get elected directly from the voters. So I think that, uh, you know, taking away the grassroots involvement and then the voters, I, I think would be just, uh, it would be very counterproductive and uh, unwise. Um, I was hoping to hear something substantive. I didn't know you guys were going to be coming in and doing this thing. I, I was hoping to hear something about what would be helpful to improve education um, and what's your top couple of ideas. They're in the, they're uh, in the report when well, you I read know, them. But we, I, st we shared yeah, with you sure. 32 recommendations, right. some of which are highlighted in terms of timeline and of cost. Right. Well, I would have liked and to I have would had a little say dialogue that in that were, area. If, that would have been nice to dialogue. If you were to, to look at this, my perspective, start early. I love the fourth grade. I love parental engagement. I love investing in teacher education. Those are the three areas that I would, Tom, that I would look at right now. Okay. Start early, invest in the infrastructure, and get the parental, as you define that broadly, in today's world, right. get them involved. There's, those are the three yeah. you can yeah. inform right now in your role That's as trustees. And, you know, and as a matter of fact, in bipartisanship, I think we're going to talk later today about uh, you know working bipartisan manner on some urban education focus that I think uh, some of us are interested in. And I, you know, I'm uh, real, you know, some of the high stakes testing and things, I'm really, I was hoping to hear something about what is in the future, coming up in the future, because I see disruptive technologies knocking out industries and knocking out professions all the time. And it seems like instead of focused on high stakes testing, we need to focus on creativity and broad, you know, what we're doing and what I think you're suggesting is, is narrowing, uh, narrowing the curriculum and narrowing the offerings of schools more and more just to, to focus on a test. Uh, and yeah. so I think our, the kids and the, the graduates in the future are going to need to be really broadly, I mean, we, we don't need to be eliminating the arts and, uh, because it's not on the test. If things aren't on the test, they get eliminated a lot of times now. And I'm glad that our ESSA plan is, is reducing that high stakes testing. So, I mean, I, I really think that uh, the idea of what is needed in the future is a real, to make sure that we are not stifling creativity, but enhancing it. And, um, and you know, what that means, that means maybe less uh, high stakes testing and more focus on, on a broad curriculum. What, what we said, and, and you're right, we, maybe we should have uh, communicated it more directly, is as we looked at what our competitors are doing that are doing two things. They're producing better results on, yes, standardized tests. And for the most part, they're also wealthier. Their per capita income is doing better than ours. So that's another good measure of, of well-being. Is when we focused on that, we came up with the following. One, that we needed to establish standards which both measured proficiency, but also those 21st century skills that um, that the economy requires, collaboration, creativity, communication, critical thinking. We ask that those be embedded in the standards and that those standards be established and left alone for a decade or more because almost all of our states and nations that are doing better set it and allow people to align. Secondly, dramatic upgrading of our teacher force. The people who are doing better have found a way to recruit from the top quarter of college-going high school students by creating status, career path, compensation. So the decision to become a teacher as opposed <coughs> to an accountant is not based on your income. It's based on your passion and your interests. That is huge. 
we did nothing else that would drive a lot. Third, we don't have a good source, because of things that have been done to the department, of um, the latest research and practice on teaching and learning. Most of our school districts are too small to generate it, charters are too small to generate it, DPSs struggles for other reasons to generate it. Almost everybody that's doing better than we do have something like a Department of Education that produces that. And then the finance, a couple of things. The way we finance education doesn't reflect anything about what it takes to educate a child. It's, it's a historic political number that we add 1% to each year. Uh, and so we need to do that. And what everybody else does just about is they invest more in the kids that have the greater needs. We do the reverse. High school kid in Birmingham, probably about 14 grand. High school kid in Detroit, about 8,500. Everybody says, no, we actually have to. And then finally, the other piece is the values and attitudes and behaviors that kids and families bring to learning. And there we still have a lot of ambivalence in our state about the value of education, how important it is. And so one of the things we talked about was ways as a community to encourage that drive to work hard, to get good grades, to study, and so forth. So we focused very much on that production function of teaching and learning. Uh, and, we, uh, and we couldn't find many places not to say there aren't different or better ways to do it, that didn't do it by focusing on those key elements that you had to get really got, get down to teaching and learning. Markets could be useful, but markets by themselves <laughs> didn't produce that. Your, your, your comment's spot on, though, too. And we took a real stab into the future with our recommendation on competency-based education. I've seen some models on that in the post-secondary, and we've seen some models of that across the nation right here in the state of Michigan. That aligns very, very well uh, in a transformation, transformational way with uh, needs within the business communities as well. So that was a thrust way into the future that takes us away from, quote unquote, just a seat time into a competency-based uh, model. It's a thought that's out there, one of our recommendations. All right, we're going to move to Pam and Dr. Z, and we've got about five minutes. And, and I thank my colleague for bringing the issue of children and education up, um, which is what we do all, while we're here, <laughs> um, since I've been here for the last two years. Um, but since you brought up the issue of politics, you brought that to the table, I do want to bring up the issue. Um, first of all, tell you that I was brought into this work and approached about being on this board because of my work around um, ensuring the health and well-being of children. Um, and so that's how I came to, to, this, to this body. And um, I still don't even really know what my party's <laughs> full platform. I have not really consulted with that um, as of yet. Um, I do want to point out that it seems to me that from what I heard in listening is that it's almost like you've put forward an ultimatum. Um, it's, it's almost like we don't have power, but if we want power, then we would be appointed by the governor versus elected by the people. That's what I heard. I also want to, um, uh, Cassandra brought up the issue of trends, and maybe we should follow the trends, because I, I am concerned about being bipartisan, uh, or any um, governance body being bipartisan, which this board is, and as has been mentioned, we work well together um, along uh, across parties. But I am concerned about the total and complete control of our governance structure here in Michigan, and you might want to follow that trend. I don't know how many states are almost completely controlled by one. Um, that's not bipartisanship. They're almost, they're, they are uh, controlled by one party? We're one of eight states that is elected. They are. Okay, but, and I'm talking about I'm talking about government oh, yeah. our our, oh, yeah. our 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 chambers of governments um, period. Um, the other thing is that when I was at a um, meeting a few weeks ago, maybe in Detroit, um, John Austin, um, who was our our um, former president and was a part of, mm -hmm. of this body that put the the 21st century body or 21st um, education plan body, and he mentioned that. Um, he was in support of, or one of the persons that helped to pin or author this thought around removing 
this body um, as an, from the people electing this body and putting it into the hands of an elected governor, um, a partisan uh, elected governor. And so um, I'm not in agreement with John Austin, and he was a Democrat. And so I, it, if what he said is true and what I heard, I know there were some other people. You may have gotten there late, Brian. You might not have been there. But um, what I heard is that this came about as um, him putting this on the table as maybe a means to get um, some other issue. Maybe it was the DEC charter or school. The, the charter school. The yeah. charter school. So I, am I? All, I'm not too. No, off. you're you're absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. So it seems like that was politics in getting this thought of eliminating this body on the agenda of of this group, right. which I don't I don't I didn't go along with the DEC. Um, and that was a Democrat who, who proposed that, and I don't go along with the Democrat who proposed this, this language. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. It doesn't seem like you're aware of that history, but um, if you're looking for a bipartisan body that is elected by the people, this is that body. What you're proposing sounds like to me a partisan governor that is putting together um, a body, and that is going against your argument here. What, what did you want to? Go ahead. I was simply going to say the commission didn't come out and recommend eliminating the State Board of Education. Let me say that again real clearly because this report doesn't recommend getting rid of the State Board of Education. It doesn't recommend the governor appointing its members. What it says is that states and nations that have been successful have an accountability that has the buck stop somewhere. And right now, we don't. And so what we ask the community to consider as a whole is how to create that. There were different ways. You could give it all to the state board and say the governor has no role at all. You could give it all to the governor. You could do a hybrid. We're simply saying the way it is fragmented now makes it difficult for anybody to lead effectively. Mm -hmm. Is that a is there a fair statement, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the document suggests three things, right? So allow the governor to appoint members of the Board of Education and allow the SBE to hire the state superintendent. Allow the governor to appoint the state superintendent and abolish the State Board of Education. Or expand the SBE and change the election process. So it does kind of suggest that you could abolish the State Board of Education. It would be one of the options that, that could be considered. But the status quo is not an option. So what we have today would not be an option put before the people. I think it's fair the commission felt that the status quo would continue the situation of no one <coughs> being in a position or on an inability of citizens to go to any person or body and say, you're accountable, you're responsible. Why aren't we improving faster because everybody can say well I don't really control all the pieces here I'm not fully accountable all we were looking for is some variant that creates accountability so under this scenario you're saying that the governor is the accountable person no that's one option that's what a lot of states do but we also said one option was make it all the state board of education so I just have one yeah. more question I just want to just make sure that then you're saying is that the variable that you're hinging this our trend in in against other uh, states on is the fact that we have a body that's elected by the people. No, no, no. no. But we're we're simply saying that we believe one of the elements that is critical for a strategy to make Michigan a high performer is a governance system that has clear accountability at the top, and. We're not saying it should be this way or that way or the other, but we're saying as long as authority is so diffuse, it's difficult to get the leadership and accountability that we're going to need to make progress. That's all we were saying. Okay, we're going to move to Dr. Z and then Michelle, and then hopefully and, uh, we'll end uh, I do need to leave in about three minutes. I'm interviewing a provost <laughs> in Allendale. Uh, all right, Dr. Z, please. Very good. I, I only have two more minutes, but my friends can stay here. I mean, I don't say that because we got to get on schedule too. But it's too bad that uh, my colleagues took as much time and that we are not 
given the time that we also wanted, yeah, yeah. wanted to, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. to, I understand. to speak. <laughs> but I want to thank you for coming. You referred to the Northwest Ordinance a couple of times, and of course uh, it's helpful to, to read the full context. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Now, this suggests a division between form and function. See, the, the function is to encourage religion, morality, and knowledge. But you're committed to the form. The big public school system, and we're going to rope in those charters and make them part of the big system. Now, this is directly contrary to what many futurists have argued about the future, that it's not the big system that's all things to all people, but rather diffused. Uh, the charter school movement is precisely this. Um, one of the things that distressed me the most about this whole report is that it is not much more than a laundry list. Now, some of the things on your laundry list are absolutely important. I mean, uh, to elevate the teaching profession is a great idea. The devil is in the details. We've taken steps to elevate the teacher uh, candidate pool and one of the immediate results is a shortage of teachers okay there are costs involved to change and the 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 sunny recommendations that have been made don't seem to count the cost and therefore they're suspect secondly there are several uh, you know the camel is a course designed by a committee this is clearly designed by a committee and so it incorporates many ideas that I know you don't support individually and go contrary to your own experience. Doug Ross, you are case one. You've made the case for economic, you know, we've got to support kids according to their need, and yet your very career and reputation is based on building a superior school in Detroit for considerably less money than the traditional public school system. You are proof positive that one of the key foundations of this recommendation, investing more money, is not necessary to improvement in education. And if you had chosen I dispute that, but please, and if you had chosen Florida instead of Massachusetts, you would have further evidence of impressive state gains without the money that Massachusetts had put in behind there. Well, I need to leave. I'm sorry, yep. but I have to go higher. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And yeah. I will uh, say thank you for your time. Please do one thing. Keep the child in mind with everything that you do, and that is the North Star. They Great. deserve it. They need your leadership to make that happen. Our state needs it. And every student is valued. And please, <laughs> please align yourself with that fundamental principle and then the rest can be done. So I thank you for your leadership. Thank okay, you. we got Michelle and Nikki, please. Yeah. Actually, that was uh, oh, you weren't done. I'm sorry, you interrupted. Go ahead. <laughs> Another lie, frankly, underlying this is exhibited in the introduction. <laughs> where it talks about our kids better than we. And what's the focus on? Level of income. As if the function of education was job training. As if the quality of life was the size of your paycheck. That is the great disjunction between this report and the Northwest Ordinance. And I want to call again our attention to the fact that education is empowering to the individual no matter what you do for a living mm -hmm. if you can learn to read you can go in your imagination to worlds across the across time and across space even if you spend the rest of your life hooked up to an iron lung in a bed 
That's why education is worth sacrificing, not because of job training or job preparation. <coughs> Even the thinking behind that is flawed. The argument is made that, oh, places with higher education have more income. My kids got great education here in Michigan, and they got jobs in California, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. What draws educated people is the jobs. The governor's role in bringing economic prosperity will do more for education than the recommendations in here in this report. Why has Michigan fallen, apart, fallen behind the other states? And may I point out that if you look at the NAEP scores, it's 1%. That means that 40 states are all glommed together, and so the difference of 1% is a space of like 15 or 20 states. So the ranking of the states is not nearly so significant as people uh, have tried to make it out to be. So, and what happened during that 10 years, 12 years that we fell behind? The other states raised their kindergarten entry, or actually technically first grade, from turning 6 December 1st to turning 6 September 1st. So now at the end of that period, we end up with our kids 5% younger on average than the other states were being compared with, which would more than explain a 1% difference in terms of performance. But instead of taking the obvious, uh, instead of pointing out the obvious, we have all kinds of expensive solutions. We had 20-some organizations report to this board two years ago how we can make up the growing gap between us and other states. Hardly anyone realized that there was a difference between the starting date for our kids and the starting date of other kids. So I guess a little of my impatience is, is coming to the fore. Um, but let's go back and let me conclude with the observation, the wisdom of the Northwest Ordinance. Charles Murray points out that the prime factor uh, for kids is intact families. This correlates with every measure of student well-being that you care. And this is an issue that has been neglected, ignored in reports like this, as well as in the public uh, discourse on this matter. I brought it up here in the, Depart in the Michigan Department of Education. They said, well, we can't control how families do their stuff. And yet, we purport to be able to control or influence prenatal behaviors. Well, if we can control and influence those behaviors, then we ought to hold up the truth to parents that when you have kids, you give them priority and not give the impression that we can make up for parental lacks through money given to public education programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michelle and then Nikki, please. Um, hi. Uh, it's, uh, no. it's an honor to meet you guys. Um, uh, I'm, uh, live in Detroit, and I'm uh, a parent, foster parent, raised 18 children in the city. I've tried the charters. I've tried the public. I did school of choice. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, I care deeply about children, and I have, now with those children having more children, I have, like, a whole tribe of children. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so there's things in the, the uh, report that I really support and, um, and are thankful that are there. Um, uh, the idea of the funding formula based on the need of the child seems to be in sync with the adequacy study, which I strongly support, and I think that that's a really good um, uh, thing to, uh, for, to you know, highlight, spotlight, and to try to move towards some uh, better funding model. Um, I do happen to think that funding makes a difference. Um, uh, so, uh, I also um, appreciate the sentiment that it's more than just the teachers that are stakeholders in the results that we currently have, and um, uh, so I, I appreciate that. Um, and the em emphasis on that we need to improve the status of teachers, because I know that the enrollment into these programs for various reasons, um, but I think probably because 
since the public shaming of them for the last 10 years, 15 years, has been um, a deterrent. Um, is, and also the pay and benefits um, be decreasing in our state is also um, doesn't help. But I, I did have some questions and, um, and some concerns. And um, one is, um, <coughs> uh, you, know, I, you know, I share the sentiments of my colleagues around the governance issues. So I want to uh, say I, I, support, I support those voices. But um, uh, when we looked at a constitutional amendment, um, I, I was disappointed that the emphasis was not on changing the word encouragement to a stronger word that other states have. I don't, there was a court case in uh, Highland Park, which was lost, where the children could not read. And, this, and our Supreme Court held that there was no obligation from the state to provide an adequate education. Now that is a really, in compared to other states, that if you're going to change anything in the Constitution, that's what needs to be changed. So, um, I, so I would ask that, and even though the report is done, that that be looked at because that's going to hold us to a lower standard than many other states. Mm -hmm. um, also, in the report, it talks about disruptive improvements, and I wasn't quite sure what disruptive was. But as a mother from Detroit, <laughs> disruptive is not what we need. We don't need anything disruptive. <laughs> We've had so much disruption in Detroit, and personally, if there was if there is one governance governing body that is controlling education right now, it is a charter lobby, who insist on no, account no accountability or very little, even though they say they're equally accountable, anybody who can read a sentence knows that's not true if they do a little research. They are not held to the same standards. They are not, um, and I, so I, appre I do appreciate where there's capital funding that's linked to more transparency. But really, when you have even Republicans calling for a moderate amount of accountability and they get a candidate to run against them because they, they, they act, actually think that there should be some accountability of these schools, moderate accountability. Those are the people, to me, that we're not talking about, but they are the ones who have hijacked our education system. And, and what we have that other states don't have is 80% of our charters being for profit and being rapidly anti-union which I don't understand at all. If we want to increase and enhance the status of teachers, we would give them a voice and ensure that they have fair pay and benefits, we would give them a voice, not fire them or change our management structure, which is the other thing that the charters do that undermine the school system and the status of teachers. But um, so I would say um, even though there are things in there I really think are great, I think the main point about why our system in our state has declined, um, uh, maybe not as much as I think, <laughs> but in, in, in Detroit in particular, we are like ground zero in the state for this failed experiment. That's where, why the fourth grade reading scores are so bad. We have so much disruption, so much um, kids going in and out to different places, and we have so much poverty. When, and middle class families have moved out, but I'm still there, middle class, but many middle class families have moved out of the city. Our concentration of poverty in the city has only grown over that period of time because of the craziness that we have in, this, in, this, in the system. So I, that's the, um, so if I was to say, I think I, I, what I, maybe it was political reasons why these issues were not openly and strongly in place and here, but to me, it's an obvious omission that should be should have been considered. It's it's like the elephant in the room. You know, the emperor has no clothes, but nobody wants to say it because maybe the emperor appointed them to the commission. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, so uh, and I also think uh, the other is the issue around um, uh, the amendment. Uh, and I also this there is I don't see in here. Maybe I missed it. Any. <coughs> any consideration for special ed students and the effects that some of these changes might have on special ed students. Uh, we talk about high standards and continuation with the testing culture, as at least it seems to me, which has minimized kids who have more difficulty doing well and creates incentives for schools to not want them there. Um, 
for whatever reasons. If they're, if they're, if they're not going to do well on a test, there's an, a baked-in incentive not to have them. And if you look at the numbers and services that are provided through many of our charters, then you'll see that there's much lower numbers of any programming, any FTEs that goes towards these children and they end up back in the traditional public schools and there's a financial deficit because of it. So that was, um, and I was on the, the, the committee for the, um, uh, the Detroit Commission that was put together. Um, and uh, so that's my two cents and I appreciate you listening to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Nikki, please. Thank you for being here. Um, I have so many thoughts. I hope that they come out coherent. Um, but I also want to be respectful and just I, yeah, I appreciate that you guys took the time to have an impact in education. I think that's important. Obviously, that's why I'm here as well. Um, uh, I remember last spring when I decided to run for State Board of Education. I had nothing else, other, uh, nothing else to do other than improving education for kids. So um, I, too, am here for that purpose. So. Um, one of the things that I've done as I've listened to everyone so far is um, I noticed that you guys said something. We were in the top 10 how many years ago? Top 20? It was actually top 15 20 years ago. Okay. And I know that the numbers are so close, but anyhow, and they can be used to make statements like this. Um, and then you also mentioned that we've been disempowered. The board has been disempowered over the last 20, 20 years. years. I would say that's your ticket right there. Um, if we're going to consider why education has gone down, um, by that uh, small percentage, that could definitely be something that we should be looking at. Um, when we don't have a Board of Education that is respected um, for the impact that they have in education, I wouldn't be surprised if you continue to see this issue. And, but I do also agree that we need to not be a board that is focused on partisan politics. So, and I've been very um, open about sharing that. Um, so I know I understand those two things are related. Um, but let's not forget that even your facts don't necessarily line up with where we were at, where we're at now, and how we've disempowered the constitutional authority that our board has to oversee K through 12 and higher education. Um, and then, even though it seems like we're you know trying to be you know dance around what we're suggesting here, and you're talking about you know the different options we have of abolishing or expanding you know the different options that we have, we are definitely making a suggestion. Like you're saying, we are suggesting accountability accountability at the top, but then people have suggested the purpose of local control is to really have accountability throughout our entire society. Individuals need to be accountable for their own choices. Um, local school districts need to be accountable to the educational outcomes of their students. It's not just accountability at the top. The system doesn't need to reflect that that's the only place that we have accountability. Um, and then if you go to page 50, which you guys are talking about evidence-based practices, which I really appreciate that conversation as it's evolving, um, you talk about the potential responsible party. The legislature must empower, must empower staff and fund MDE for this expanded role. Uh, MDE must recruit the best staff and create systems that can support diverse policies and evidence-based practice. There you have right there sort of what your intentions really are. The intentions are very, very clear. But if we go back to the fact that we have slid downward, we used to be one of the best top 10, top 15. We've disempowered the Board of Education. Um, why, would, why must we then change that um, power structure <coughs> in a way that was working before? And then one more thing. I understand that we all need to remember that our North Star is what's best for children. But I would also really, um, really challenge all, peop all parties that are invested in education, even ed reformers that stand to make money off of any changes that we make over the next however many years or during this um, cycle. Um, they also need to keep children as their North Star too. And then together we really can come together and work better. I could, uh, we're, are we at the end? Mr. Yes, please. Yeah. I guess I would say, uh, first of all, very, useful and interesting to get all of the feedback. I think the best, our purpose, I think the reason we were put into being, was to um, stimulate a dialogue, an agenda, an action. As I said, I think, and I think I can speak for Tom, the best way to respond to all of this, and all of the shortcomings, and all of the misunderstandings, and all of the errors, is yourselves to create a board 
large scope agenda that you sh that you own collectively and are behind, that's the most eloquent and the most effective response to this. It's easy to criticize it and it should be criticized. We are here for one reason, to ask you to demonstrate that you are the place where the buck ought to stop and that we think the best way to do that is to put together this bipartisan, authoritarian, libertarian, shared plan that the state can get behind. So. Thank you. It's a good yeah, segue to tap yep. 10 and 10. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so this report, where does it go? What, what happens to it? Uh, I think Tom alluded to the fact that this is done, this is, you have done your job. We've done our job. The okay, so where does this go? It'll be up to the leadership of the legislature and the governor's office. Again, I'll, I'll emphasize it was designed to be, the governor said it many times, a five to seven year plan. He knows he's only got less than two years left. We're trying to set forth a bipartisan uh, plan that's based on what's working around the country and the world. This is not a far right plan by any stretch. Uh, this is not a, a, a left plan. This, is, this, this has a lot of bipartisan tone to it. We worked through a lot of tough issues. When you think when we started, this was July, we have a new president and a new secretary of education at the federal level uh, from the time that this was started. I don't recommend that Michigan takes a let's defend the status quo uh, path. I think we need to be very serious about uh, the actions we're taking to uh, to become a, more, a, a higher performing uh, state. I think a lot of those are in place, but I, you know, the, as, as we talked about, the, some of our governance, funding, and accountability structures are behind. Governance is simply decision making. Decision making affects climate. Decision making affects whether a teacher uh, wants to remain in the classroom or leave. How we make decisions, who has authority to do what, all has implications where it matters the most, which is the classroom. Some of these recommendations, in my opinion, they didn't go far enough because a lot of them don't create that, that system that 100,000 really sharp people want to be a part of. You've got a million and a half kids, you run the numbers, we've got 99,000 teachers in the state, every one of them needs to be just sharp and ready to, to take on the challenges that are coming because the kids are harder to educate than they used to be due to the impacts of poverty. I'm thrilled to hear that there seems to be a bipartisan tone to, to addressing some of the urban issues uh, related to poverty. It, that that's good. It's just bringing things to scale as quickly as the kids need us to bring them to scale is very challenging in this in this system of governance. So we studied it. We we and, and it needs a lot more study. You brought up some outstanding points. I wish all of you had been on the commission. As you bring up great points, it needs continued dialogue so we can we can develop a, a system uh, that that is designed to meet the needs of all all children. The elements are in there, but it's not done. And by the way, Richard, it is in recommendation five about the partnering with parents. So I just yes, want to say that again, this, the board, the department, the community did come up with a top 10 and 10 plan to make us a top 10 performing state. We are doing a crosswalk between these very, you know, the good recommendations made here by the 21st Century Commission. And, and for those that the board wishes to include in the top 10 and 10 plan, we will be doing that. But, you know, we do have a plan to make Michigan a top 10 state that includes a lot of these great recommendations. And I think we do want to be held accountable as the state superintendent and the state board to make us a top 10 state uh, over these next few years by working together to make it happen. With that said, we need to move on. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move the uh, top 10 and 10 presentation till this afternoon. We're going to try to get that done. Right now, the next item on the committee whole agenda is a discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. We have one grant program, Criteria for Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, Regional ISD Partnership Grants for 500000 Does anybody have any questions you would like us to answer before this afternoon? Seeing none, we are going to adjourn till 1 o'clock. Remember, at 1 o'clock, we do have a tornado drill. It means we need to walk down the stairs, uh, go all the way down to the far bottom, uh, and uh, we'll be down there for five minutes or so while they clear, make sure the building's clear, and then we'll get an all call. Go ahead. Yep. I have uh, a question uh, yep. concerning, okay, so we talked about this report and the top 10 and 10 being very aligned. Ex the only two areas I know it's not is the enhanced accountability and the conversation on governance. Okay. How, what about the ESA plan? Yep. They're both aligned. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, we are adjourned until after the tornado drill at 1. <laughs>